A pair of SCP Foundation researchers open the door of a containment cell and find themselves staring at something unlike anything they've ever seen before. Sitting in the middle of the room is a giant lump that appears to be made of what can only be described as flesh. The two look at each other in disbelief. Just what is this thing? They circle the huge blob, looking it over, wondering what on earth it could be. One of the researchers finally gets the courage to actually feel it. He finds that it's warm to the touch. And does he detect some slight movement? He slowly moves to place his ear against it to listen, but a sudden shudder from the mask sends him jumping back in fright. Just then, the other researcher calls to him from the other side of the sphere. It sounds like he has found something. As he approaches, he too sees what caused his partner to call out. There, in the middle of this tumorous ball, is a door. It's a circular iron hatch, the kind sealed by a valve, and it's open. Now the researchers are really confused. A massive lump of living flesh is strange enough, but why does it have a door? One of the researchers peeks inside. Is that a couch they see? And a table? Does someone live in this thing? Things are getting beyond strange. The two researchers look up at the observation window where their supervisor is watching them. The supervisor does not hesitate. He nods at them, and the researchers know what they must do. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. The researcher who lost winces. He knew that coming to work at the SCP Foundation meant that he would be dealing with some strange, dangerous, and disgusting anomalies. But he never imagined he would have to climb inside a giant orb of meat. His partner opens the hatch all the way and offers a hand to help him. Knowing he has no other option, the researcher steps inside. Inside, the air is hot, thick, and moist, like a cramped gym that's had too many bodies exerting themselves on a warm, humid day. He walks through the short entranceway, and his eyes adjust to the dim light to find that he's standing in the middle of a cozy little room. A single, small lamp on a table is giving off just enough light for him to see that the room is sparsely furnished, with a few pieces including a small couch and a twin bed. Outside, his partner calls to him, asking what he can see. As the researcher turns to answer, the door snaps shut. The valve spins on its own, locking itself tight. Try as he might, the researcher can't get it to budge. He bangs on the door and yells, Is he alright in there? Is everything okay? His only response is a muffled scream from inside the ball of flesh. He keeps pulling at the door, twisting the valve with all of his strength, but it won't move. The sounds of gurgles and wet sloshing come from inside the meaty growth. An alarm starts to sound as he strains against the door, exerting himself so hard that he feels like a vein in his head might burst. Suddenly, the valve loosens, and the sudden lack of resistance causes him to fall to the floor. The valve spins on its own, and the door swings open once again. The ball of flesh is quiet once more. The researcher picks himself up off the ground and slowly, carefully, peeks inside. Hello? Are you okay? Is anyone in there? There's no response. That is until a blast of hot air comes rushing out of the hatch, blowing the researcher's hair back. When it's over, he peeks inside again. His fellow researcher is nowhere to be seen. Inside is the same couch, bed, and table with a small lamp. But there's something new there, too. Across from the couch, where there was nothing before, is a small television. While this may seem strange, it's just another day at the SCP Foundation, where anomalous objects and creatures are studied and contained, including SCP-002, also known as The Living Room. SCP-002 is the designation given to a large, tumorous, fleshy growth. It's roughly spherical, with a circumference just over 15 meters, giving it an estimated volume of around 60 meters cubed. Located on one side is an iron valve hatch, similar to what might be found on an old submarine, which leads into the interior of the ball. Those who step inside are surprised to discover a small room that resembles a low-rent studio apartment, complete with furniture and even a small window. Strangely, the outside of the ball of flesh shows no windows, and indeed no openings at all, save for the iron hatch. The furniture in the room displays no anomalous properties, 
though examination has revealed that the furniture appears to be constructed of sculpted bone, woven hair, and other biological substances, all coming from human bodies. Analysis of samples taken from the furniture has shown each to be constructed from independent and fragmented DNA sequences, several of which correspond to SCP research personnel who have been lost inside of SCP-002. To date, the living room has been responsible for seven members of staff going missing. At the same time, during the course of its containment at the SCP Foundation, the room appears to have added multiple additional furnishings, including two lamps, a throw rug, a television, a radio, a beanbag chair, three books in an unknown language, four children's toys, and a small potted plant. Tests have been performed using a variety of non-human entities in order to see if they would provoke a similar response from SCP-002 to that of humans. Various lab animals, including those with close DNA to humans such as chimpanzees, have been placed in the room. But so far, all have failed to make the living room react. Human cadavers were also tested, but they too did not produce any effect. It is unknown what causes SCP-002 to engage in its behavior, but whatever process it uses to convert organic matter into furnishings seems to only be triggered by the presence of living human beings. SCP-002 was discovered in northern Portugal following reports of an object falling from Earth's orbit. There in the bottom of a small crater was SCP-002. It was encased in a thick shell of rock, but the anomaly's fleshy exterior could be seen through cracks that were likely created by the impact. A local farmer was the first to spot the object falling to Earth and brought word of what he found to his village. At the same time, a Level 4 SCP Foundation agent stationed in the area detected elevated levels of radioactivity and traced the source back to the crater. An SCP collection squad led by General Mulhausen was dispatched to the impact site and quickly secured the area. Test subjects from the nearby village were recruited for initial analysis of the object, with three men being individually sent inside of SCP-002, all of whom disappeared. Having confirmed this anomaly's deadly properties, General Mulhausen then issued a Level 4A termination order that would apply to any local witnesses in order to ensure that no knowledge of the object reached the outside world. He then oversaw its transport to an SCP containment facility. As Foundation staff prepped SCP-002 for relocation, four members of the security personnel were seemingly mesmerized and drawn inside the object where they too disappeared. This was the first hint that SCP-002 possesses some form of subtle mind control with the ability to influence humans into stepping inside of it. It was after these losses that it was first noticed that the object appeared to grow new furnishings following someone disappearing inside. After these mishaps, General Mulhausen ordered all staff to wear hazmat suits when dealing with SCP-002, and following the General's own termination, SCP-002 was placed in containment at the secure facility where it currently resides. Due to the ongoing danger presented by SCP-002, the risk it poses to any who step inside of it, and the mind control abilities it possesses, it has been classified as Euclid. It is to remain connected at all times to a suitable power supply to keep it in a charging mode of some kind, which appears to make it more docile. In the event of a power outage, staff in the immediate area are to be evacuated and the object's containment cell emergency barrier is to be closed, sealing it off from the rest of the site. Once power is re-established, strobing X-ray and ultraviolet lights are to be activated in the containment cell until SCP-002 is returned to its charging mode. Research teams investigating SCP-002 that will come within 20 meters of the object must consist of no fewer than two members. Personnel should also maintain physical contact with one another at all times to confirm that the other is present and not experiencing any feelings of confusion, dulled perception, or other forms of bewilderment that may lead to them entering the living room. No personnel at all below a level 3 clearance are allowed inside of SCP-002, and any staff that have contact with the anomaly are to be escorted no less than 5 kilometers away and must undergo a 72-hour quarantine and psychological evaluation. SCP-002 is one of the oldest anomalies in the SCP Foundation database, but remains one of the least understood. Perhaps one day we'll understand what it is and why it was at one time sitting in the orbit of Earth. Did someone send it here, intending us to one day find it? Did it come here of its own volition? Or did we put it there ourselves, in an attempt to keep it away?
It's late at night, and you're driving down a desolate stretch of highway somewhere in New Mexico. There's nothing out here except for you, your car, and the road. What you don't know is that you're about to encounter something. Something terrifying. There's no moon, and the sky is pitch black. Your own car is barely lighting up the dark road ahead of you. Just then, you spot something in your rearview mirror. It's a pair of headlights. There's nothing too strange about them, except that they are especially bright. Your eyes are so adjusted to the darkness that you have to look away. When you glance in the mirror again, you see that they're closer. Much closer. They must be going awfully fast. You don't know why, but something about the car behind you makes you feel uneasy. There's something off. You speed up a little. Maybe you can keep some distance from them. But the lights keep getting closer. So you speed up a little more. Still, they gain on you, growing bigger and bigger in your rearview mirror. You're getting nervous. They look like they are barreling right towards you. You floor it. The lights are able to keep up easily, though. And now, they're right on your tail. No matter how fast you go, they stay right behind you. The lights are so bright and close that they're almost blinding. You're in a full-blown panic. What is going on? Now the lights are swerving back and forth behind you. What do they want? You take a sharp turn without indicating, but they follow you without difficulty. You keep your foot smashed down on the accelerator. Your engine is screaming, but they just get closer and closer. They're right on your bumper. The bright white lights burn your eyes so bad that you swat at the rearview mirror to point it down. You look up just in time to see the deer standing in the middle of the road. You slam on your brakes as hard as you can. Your tires squeal loudly in the night, and you brace yourself to both hit the deer and get rear-ended from behind. You stop inches from the deer as something incredible happens. The two headlights seem to split, passing by you on either side of your car. You and the deer lock eyes for a split second as if you're both thinking, what was that? Before the deer hops away into the night. You don't know what's happening, but you're not going to wait around to find out. You throw the car in reverse and hit the gas before whipping it around 180 degrees. You can't remember how far the last town was, but there's no chance you're going in the direction of those lights. You drive as fast as you can, checking your mirror constantly to see if anything is behind you. Nothing. Just darkness. Maybe you're finally safe. No, they're right in front of you. The lights somehow appear out of nowhere right in front of your car. You turn the wheel hard to avoid a head-on collision and you go flying off the road, smashing your head against the window as the car goes flipping and rolling and tumbling. The car comes to a stop a hundred feet off the road, upside down, with a lone blinking turn signal dimly lighting up the surrounding field. A single headlight approaches the car, but it's not moving like a vehicle, it's moving like an animal. You're concussed from the accident and your vision is starting to fade. The last thing you see is a second light approaching. The next morning, the local sheriff is investigating the scene of a single car accident. Curiously, there's no body, just a few scraps of clothing and a pair of tennis shoes sitting neatly in the upside-down roof of the car. Strangest, though, are the childlike handprints all over the dirty car door. The sheriff doesn't know what to think. What the sheriff doesn't know is that he has just come upon the aftermath of an SCP-745 attack a strange and mysterious creature known as the Headlights. SCP-745 is the classification the SCP Foundation has given to a bipedal, nocturnal predator whose hunting grounds are an abandoned stretch of highway in northern New Mexico. SCP-745's most distinctive feature, by far, is its head, the top of which is a bloated sack of translucent skin. There are no visible sensory organs present on the head, nor does it appear to have a solid skull and the creature's brain can be directly seen through the semi-transparent skin, which is covered in a web of bioluminescent organs. These organs are capable of producing a steady output of light that's been measured between 1400 to 3200 lumens, which is the equivalent of bright xenon gas headlights. The entity has been observed to have the ability to change the color of this light, as well as flash it in specific patterns. It is theorized that it engages in this behavior as a way to defend itself, and potentially may also use it as a way to communicate with other members of its species. The rest of SCP-745's body is covered in skin that is a deep, dark, black color that almost seems to absorb light. This quality, 
when paired with their blindingly bright head protrusion, gives the appearance of a floating point of light in the darkness. Because SCP-745 entities hunt almost exclusively in pairs, with their preferred hunting grounds being remote sections of highway, they are easily mistaken for oncoming or approaching headlights. Two SCP-745 entities are able to move together in perfect synchronicity, running in tandem at speeds up to 180 kilometers per hour. Together, they will target lone vehicles that they spot on the highway, and will begin to chase or run straight towards them, giving the unlucky driver the impression that a fast-moving car is rapidly approaching them. After they near the targeted car, they will attempt to stop it by any means necessary, whether by simply forcing the driver to pull over out of fear, or by running them off the road completely. Once their prey has stopped, crashed, or become otherwise incapacitated, the pair will stop moving together and approach the car separately to directly assault and then consume the vehicle's occupants. Next to no remains are left following an attack, save for a few scraps of clothing in the victim's shoes. Other than the damage sustained during the accident, there is never any other sign of struggle or forced entry, with the only other evidence left at the scene being the childlike handprints from SCP-745's small front paws. Strangely, analysis of SCP-745's genetic structure has revealed that unlike humans, they are not a carbon-based life form, meaning it is unlikely then that they are able to derive any nutrition from the consuming of human flesh. It is theorized then that they may be hunting solely for sport or some other form of perverse enjoyment. This question remains unanswered as currently there are no recorded observations of SCP-745 feeding in the wild, as successful attacks have never left any witnesses, and specimens captured by the SCP Foundation refuse to eat at all. No layers, nests, or other refuge of SCP-745 has ever been found, nor has the Foundation located any breeding grounds or young examples of the entity. It's unknown how or if they reproduce, or when they may have first appeared. What is known is that they had established a wide hunting territory across the American Southwest until Foundation teams began a program to thin their numbers in the 1960s. The effort appears to have been successful so far, and all recent sightings of SCP-745 have been limited to a specific stretch of highway in northern New Mexico. SCP-745 has been classified as Euclid, and in order to limit potential exposure to civilians, the Foundation has purchased the land surrounding the highway with traffic being redirected to other roads. Foundation security teams disguised as highway patrol officers are to remove any trespassers or lost travelers who accidentally find themselves on the dangerous stretch of highway. The security teams are also tasked with attempting to capture any instances of SCP-745 that they can, and any recovered creatures, live or dead, are to be loaded into Class 3 BCU storage containers and transferred to Site-17 for further study. Containment procedures that are able to preserve living specimens are still being researched, and currently, no examples of SCP-745 have survived for more than a week in captivity. However, seeing as there have been no new sightings of SCP-745 outside of the isolated and monitored stretch of highway, and all reports of phantom lights elsewhere in the country have not pointed to evidence of additional SCP-745 outbreaks, they are considered to be effectively contained. The sun rises over the battlefield. The American flag flaps gently in the wind. The world is silent. Bang! The door slams open, and the boy runs out of the house, making plane noises with his mouth. The toy bomber in his hand arcs and soars, dipping and diving, as it makes its imaginary bombing run around the backyard. Over the sandbox, swooping low through the thick grass, past the pond, under the swing set, and up, up, and away into the sky climbing higher and higher in the direction of the treehouse with its American flag flapping in the morning breeze. What a perfect day. The boy breathes in the air deeply and looks around. His shoulders slump. He's bored already. Two seconds in the yard and he's already bored. What is there to do out here that he hasn't already done? He's played in the sand, he's swung on the swings, he's climbed up to the treehouse. He hears the car engine kicking into life somewhere out front. His dad's voice carries over to him on the breeze. I'm running late for work, I'll see you later. If you find my bag anywhere, don't go looking inside of it, just tell me where it is when I get home. Love you, bye. The wheels crunch through the gravel driveway, and the engine's sound slowly fades into the distance, leaving the boy alone in the backyard again, with nothing but the wind for company. Great, now he's got to find something to do for the whole day. He throws the toy bomber to the ground in frustration. A wing snaps off and bounces away into the flower bed. Uh-oh, he'll need to fix that before Dad gets home. Super glue, that'll do the trick. 
There must be some inside. His dad is always fixing things. But the boy's mission is almost immediately sidetracked. As soon as he steps into the house, he spots his dad's bag right by the back door, where he always forgets to look. The boy looks at it curiously for a moment. He wonders what's in there that his dad told him not to look at. He'll just have a little peek, not a proper look. He won't even open the bag all the way, just a little look inside. If anyone asks, he'll say he was looking for super glue. Wait, what's that? It can't be. A little pot with a red lid and big cartoonish letters on the side. Play-Doh? What's his dad doing with a pot of Play-Doh in his bag? He thought his dad had a really grown-up job. That's what his mom always says. His dad has a very secret grown-up job, very important, very secret. Is that really what he does at work all day, play with Play-Doh? The boy is far too grown up for Play-Doh. He hasn't played with it for years because it's for babies. No way is he going to play with it now. Nope, he's a big boy who plays with real toys. But still, a little look won't hurt. He'll take it out, squeeze it in his hands a bit, remember how babyish it is, and put it back. He definitely isn't going to play with it. The boy pops the red lid off and peers inside. Yep, just as he thought. Boring. Just a lump of red putty, sitting there being all… all boring. But as the boy tips the pot out into his hand, it feels a bit weird. It moves a little in his palm. Is there an insect inside it or something? It feels like a pair of little legs. He rolls the lump over into his other hand and peers at it. Yes, a pair of legs sticking out from the red ball. Only they're not insect legs at all. They're tiny, about the size of insect legs, but there are only two of them. They're totally red, matching the color of the Play-Doh, and seem to have a tiny pair of boots on the ends of them. The legs wiggle around helplessly, sticking up into the air, until all of a sudden, a hand appears sticking up out of the clay. It looks like a tiny person has somehow been buried in the Play-Doh upside down. The hand gets a good grip on the red ball and pushes and pulls at it, steadily freeing the rest of its body, until suddenly, a fully formed tiny man pops out of the surface. Roughly the size of the boy's fingernail, the little red man stands up straight and takes in his surroundings. Not only is the tiny person wearing boots, he's also got a backpack and a helmet on his miniature head, all made of Play-Doh. In fact, this tiny person looks just like one of those little green army man toys that his dad had when he was little. The little soldier looks up and sees the boy staring down at him, jumping back in fright. The boy laughs. He guesses he must look pretty scary to someone so small. He smiles at the little army man. The little army man very slowly lowers himself down to his knees, reaching down to the Play-Doh floor he's standing on. His little red hand seems to be feeling around for something in the putty. In fascination, the boy stares closely as the Play-Doh under the soldier's hand morphs into the shape of… what is that? A gun! The soldier lifts the tiny red rifle to his shoulder and points it straight at the boy's eye. He fires, and to the boy's surprise, something comes out. A stream of teeny tiny Play-Doh bullets pepper his eyeball. The boy throws the Play-Doh ball as hard as he can and blinks hard. A tiny scream goes with it. The bullets didn't really hurt that much, but his eye is a little watery now. The tiny soldier has a real working tiny assault rifle. He's starting to understand why his dad is still playing with Play-Doh. Where did that Play-Doh go? He must have thrown it into the backyard. The boy runs outside and looks around. There it is, just next to the sandbox. He creeps up to the ball cautiously, trying to see if the little soldier is still there. Wait, hang on. There he is. No, there he is. Is that another one? He kneels and peers at the small crowd gathering around the ball. He can't quite believe what he's seeing. Dozens of little men are milling around the red ball, with more marching out of it in formation every few seconds. Little red Play-Doh tents are being erected in a perimeter around the ball. A couple of tiny soldiers chop down a twig with tiny red axes and start a campfire. A mini red jeep weaves its way through the grass, and a general hops out, with a cowering officer by his side. The tiny general barks tiny orders. It's difficult to hear what the man is saying, but it sounds like he's speaking English, only really high-pitched. He points to a group of soldiers who immediately rush over to the ball of Play-Doh and pull a ladder out of it. They rest the ladder against the edge of the sandbox, and a couple of them hurry their way to the top. Climbing up onto the wooden board, the pair of them split up, rifles in hand, checking the area is clear. The general is the next up the ladder. He surveys the yard with a battle-worn wariness, eyes coming to rest on the treehouse. He pulls out his binoculars and takes a good hard look at it, studying every inch of the tree before spotting the flagpole rising from the top. Lowering the binoculars with evident satisfaction, the general points a tiny hand at the enormous tree and cries out an order at the top of his little voice. A high pitch rises from the troops on the ground. They pump fists and slap backs. The army has grown already. 
As the boy looks back down at the platoon gathering in the grass, he sees a dozen more tents have sprung up. A group of soldiers stand in formation around the ball of Play-Doh, keeping watch in every direction. And there, a soldier sits on an acorn, crying. Helmet in his hands, he weeps openly. There is a red cross on the tent next to him. That must be the medical tent. The boy crouches down on all fours and peers inside the tent. There, on the tiny red bed, surrounded by tiny red nurses, lies a soldier. His legs are bent out of shape, and he's crying out in pain. A doctor approaches and gives him the bad news before readying the saw. The boy sits back up. He can't watch. A high-pitched cry echoes from the tent, loud enough to dampen the commotion around the rest of the camp. The boy recognizes that scream. It's the same scream he heard when he threw the Play-Doh out of the door. That first brave soldier, defending his brothers in arms from the giant. What had the boy done? The soldier outside the medical tent picks up the phone and informs the tiny soldier's tiny family what had happened. He had lost both his legs, but not his life. He was a hero. The battalion is mobilizing. No time to mourn. Snipers climb the ladder onto the edge of the sandbox and set up nests all along the wooden beam as trucks rumble through the thick grass below. On the other side of the sandbox wall, a desert platoon makes its way through the scorching heat. Soldiers sit atop tanks, shaking the last remaining drops of doughy water from their red bottles and wiping sweat from their brows, all of them heading in the direction of the treehouse. The boy stands up, surrounded by tiny soldiers. He has to be careful where he steps now as they fill the grass around him. A couple of tanks rumble between his feet, flattening the blades of grass as if they were as weak as, well, blades of grass. All of the soldiers, all of the equipment and vehicles, everything is coming from the little ball of red Play-Doh. And little is the right word for it. With every new unit deployed to the front line, the ball shrinks slightly. It's getting smaller and smaller by the minute. They're going to need reinforcements. The boy rushes into the house and returns in just a few seconds, arms laden with Play-Doh. He's got every pot of it from when he was little. He pops them all open, one after the other, and throws them onto the ground in the midst of the camp. The only slight issue is that all the Play-Doh is that gross brown color that it goes when you mix all the colors together. That won't matter, will it? Gunfire breaks out almost immediately below him. The boy jumps back in surprise, stepping on a communications mast by accident. Tiny brown soldiers rush out of the Play-Doh balls all around the camp, diving into cover and opening fire on the red soldiers. It's a massacre. Red soldiers taking a rest from the front line, calling their loved ones, getting ready to go home on leave, lying injured in beds. All of them are gunned down. Most don't even have a chance to grab their rifles. One brave red soldier sprints to the communications mast and tries to radio the rest of the battalion, telling them what's happened, but the mast is destroyed. A stray bullet catches him in the side of his head, and he crumbles to the ground, just a lifeless blob of Play-Doh. The boy watches in horror as a couple of brown soldiers pick up the body and toss it into the nearest ball of brown Play-Doh. A dedicated team of them mix the body in with the rest of the dough until it's that same brown color. From the blob emerges a new brown soldier. The small red streak running across his heart is the only sign that he'd ever been a red at all. The soldier quickly disappears amongst the mass of helmets and boots, trampling any trace of the red army. The whole yard erupts in tiny warfare. The red snipers lining the walls of the sandbox are picked off one after the other. The desert platoon are ambushed by landmines and quickly surrounded, hiding in broken down tanks as plumes of sand are thrown up all around them. Before long, the brown troops have them completely surrounded. One last soldier bursts out from the hatch in his tank, holding grenades in each hand. The bullet catches him in the head before he can even finish his war cry. The grenades explode harmlessly, nowhere near the brown troops. The red convoy, on its way to the tree, stands the best chance of survival. The boy follows them with fascination, watching as the brown army fight their way through the red line from the back, splitting it through the middle as their superior firepower makes short work of the transport and supply trucks. Some red soldiers dive away into the thick grass, climbing up dandelions and weeds in a desperate attempt to escape. Few succeed, as the bodies fall back into the mud like raindrops. A tiny screaming noise fills the yard. The boy turns around just in time to jump out of the way of the brown fighter jets. Five of them streak through the air, almost at his head height. Missiles fire out of the bottom of each jet, one after the other, blowing apart what little remains of the red convoy. The gunfire dies down within the hour. Skirmishes break out across the yard as brown patrols pick off the stragglers they find from the red army hiding in ants' nests, under fallen leaves, and huddling around broken down vehicles. The boy watches as several high-ranking officers gather in the brown base to oversee the absorption of the last of the red ball of Play-Doh. They mold themselves a big meeting table with a brown map of the yard 
and plot out their strategy for taking the treehouse for themselves, moving around even tinier little model units across the surface of it with sticks. The plan quickly comes together before the boy's eyes and under his feet. A series of mortars and surface-to-air missiles are deployed along the wall of the sandbox. The Air Force takes over the original brown base, chopping down blades of grass and laying out Play-Doh runways flanked with brown hangars. A ring of military units surround the base of the treehouse, strategizing about how best to ascend the colossal structure and reach the flagpole. In the pond, an aircraft carrier splashes into the water, marking the arrival of the Navy. The ship is soon flanked by a pair of destroyers armed with anti-aircraft missiles. The boy is about to go over and peer into the water to try and spot a nuclear submarine when he comes across a sight for sore eyes. Red soldiers, not much more than a single squadron, hunkered down around the base of the swing set. They've covered themselves in dirt and little clumps of moss to camouflage. They must be the forwardmost scout squadron, just far enough away from that original convoy to escape the slaughter. But what are they doing? The units are all gathered around a pile of leaves. There's something underneath. What is it? It looks like plastic. Of course, it's his toy bomber with the broken wing. Trying not to draw the attention of the brown army, the boy drops to the ground next to the red units, doing his best to hide in the grass. The red soldiers are arguing amongst themselves. The general is there. He's survived, but barely, slumped against a blade of grass. The scout's high-pitched arguing is a little too quiet for the boy to make out, but it's pretty clear what's going on. They need to get the toy plane working, but it'll be hopeless without the other wing. He lifts his head and looks around the yard. There it is, in the flower bed. But it's surrounded by brown troops. How could the red soldiers possibly fight their way to it and get back unharmed? Oh, wait. The boy just gets up, walks over to the flower bed, and picks up the wing. In about three seconds, he completes an insurmountable effort for those little soldiers. Kneeling next to them, he offers the missing wing. The scouts all stand back warily. It's the general who climbs to his feet and walks over to the boy. He looks at the plastic wing, looks up at the giant towering over him, and raises his arm in a salute. The others follow suit quickly and get to work repairing the toy plane. Brown soldiers notice the commotion and start to close in on them. They don't have much time. The boy stamps out a runway for the soldiers in the grass. The plane is almost ready to go, but is missing one vital piece of the propeller. Only there's a bigger problem. They're out of red Play-Doh. A brown soldier breaks through the thick grass and rushes towards the squadron, his assault rifle peppering the side of the plane with doughy bullets. The scouts all dive into the vehicle and kick the engine into gear. Little red gears and pistons whir into life beneath the plastic, but the plane just isn't moving without the propeller. What can they do? The brown soldier stops in his tracks, staring at the plane. The boy peers at him closer. There's a red streak across his heart. Conflict contorts the tiny soldier's face. The door to the plane opens and out steps the general. The two soldiers face each other on the runway, the red scouts desperately calling the general to get back in. None of them move. The brown soldier raises his rifle and shoots the general in the head. The older man crumples to the ground. Inside the plane, the scouts start to panic. They don't have their guns with them. The brown army is bearing down on them from all sides. What can they do? The brown soldier with the streak across his heart walks slowly over to the general's body, stoops down, and picks him up. He carries the body around to the front of the plane and, without a word, starts using the Play-Doh to build them a propeller. Brown soldiers burst through the grass, swarming the runway. They need to leave, now or never. The brown soldier places the propeller onto the plane and steps aside as the vehicle roars off along the runway. He salutes the ascending plane as one of his brown compatriots puts a bullet in his chest right through his red heart. But the plane is already away, lifting off into the sky. The toy bomber dodges and weaves its way between the whizzing bullets. It banks hard, pulling the nose around inch by inch to face the treehouse. The pilot guns it, pulling the tiny stick back sharply. It seems to take an age for the bomber to climb. The boy glances behind him just in time to see the brown navy launch their missiles, six of them, all making a beeline for the bomber. Or so it seems. At the last moment, he sticks a hand out and slaps the missiles out of the air. A couple of them explode, leaving streaks of brown Play-Doh on his hand. The others spiral to the ground, where tiny soldiers dive for cover. The brown Air Force scrambles, but it's too late. As the jets shoot across the yard, the bomber has already reached its destination. The scouts jump out, deploying red Play-Doh parachutes as they circle their way down onto the flagpole. A jet catches up to the bomber and blows it out of the sky. The scouts don't have time to mourn their lost pilot, or any of their dead for that matter. Quick as they can, they cut the American flag free. As it flutters and floats down to the grass, the squadron unfurls its replacement. A red rectangle of Play-Doh, barely a couple of inches across. 
One of them pulls a bugle from his pack and plays the highest pitch version of the last post you could ever hear. The whole battlefield falls silent to listen. The boy places a hand over his heart just as the first drop of rain hits his shoulder. From somewhere inside, his mom's voice calls. It's about to start raining. Come inside before you catch a cold. I'm making cocoa. The boy grins and runs into the house. Outside, the rain pours and all trace of the war washes away into red and brown streaks in the dirt. And with that, you'd be forgiven for thinking that SCP-705 had never even been in that young boy's backyard. Most adults would just dismiss the boy's afternoon entertainment as a figment of a child's imagination, but most adults have not encountered SCP-705, otherwise known as militarized Play-Doh. The results of a redacted megacorporation's research into creating a self-molding product, the specific mechanics of how this militarized Play-Doh was created are hazy to say the least. What is known is that the small red blob of what appears to be the popular children's sculpting toy exhibits aggressive militaristic tendencies. As soon as the five-ounce pot is opened, SCP-705 activates, forming itself into miniature Play-Doh soldiers. Each unit comes dressed in detailed and accurate military fatigues, carrying miniaturized weaponry and equipment, all of which function identically to their real-life counterparts, aside from one small detail. Everything is made entirely from Play-Doh. When active, SCP-705 can divide into hundreds of infantrymen, each of which seems to have some level of personal autonomy. As of yet, no hive mind mentality has been observed between the soldiers. They all communicate as their real-life military equivalents would, through barking orders, strategizing, and working together. Upon activation, each instance of SCP-705 is highly territorial, seeking to take immediate control of the nearest location or object that seems to be of strategic importance. This could be anything from a coffee machine to a treehouse. What appear to be innocuous household objects to us pose an incredible tactical advantage to the tiny soldiers, many of whom are willing to sacrifice their lives to take control. The longer this militarized Play-Doh is allowed to roam free, the more advanced the military unit becomes. Leadership figures emerge, battle plans grow more and more advanced, and technology improves. While the Play-Doh may initially take the form of a handful of infantry units, if left to their own devices, these units will soon be riding on the backs of tanks, firing miniguns through the doors of attack helicopters, or even developing rudimentary navies and air forces. And of course, you have seen what happens when SCP-705 comes into contact with a regular pot of Play-Doh. The otherwise harmless putty will take on the same characteristics as this militarized Play-Doh. If the two groups of soldiers are the same color, they will form an alliance. If they are different colors, well, that's where the fun begins. Containing SCP-705 is relatively straightforward. Simply gathering all of the Play-Doh together and putting it back into its 5-ounce pot with the lid closed will neutralize the tiny army entirely. This, coupled with how harmless the tiny, doughy bullets are, means that SCP-705 requires little security. It is housed in Sector 2 safe SCP containment with the lid closed. The only accidental outbreak that has occurred since its containment has been in the break room when a researcher accidentally left the lid open while they went to the bathroom. When the researcher returned, all they needed to do to rescue their coffee from the clutches of a crazed Play-Doh general was brush a few soldiers off the counter. This is a day SCP-705 still talks about often with deep fear and reverence. It's Saturday night, and a teenaged boy and girl are out on a date. They are strolling through a shopping mall with plans to see a movie later at the theater attached to the mall. As they walk through the mall waiting for their show to start, the girl spots something. It's a photo booth. She excitedly grabs the boy's hand and pulls him inside. They close the curtain, insert a coin, and the machine comes to life, snapping a series of photos. The two exit the booth, but both seem to be a little… off. It's getting close to showtime, though, so they start making their way to the movie theater. Meanwhile, unbeknownst to the mall patrons, something is happening deep below the ground. The boy and girl exit the theater and walk arm in arm through the alley back toward the parking lot where the boy left his car. It's late now, the sun has long since set, and they're all alone. But they don't hear the footsteps behind them, or sense the pair of bodies that are following them, getting closer and closer. They get to the car, it's the only one left in the parking lot, and the boy takes out his keys to unlock the car when he fumbles and drops them to the ground. As he bends over to pick them up, he finally sees who has been following them. It's them, a pair of doppelgangers coming straight towards them. 
they look exactly like the boy and girl, except for their faces, which are horribly distorted, with strange lumps and no eyes or mouths. They look as though they were a drawing of a face that was somehow smudged out. The boy quickly gets the keys and grabs the girl, dragging her away from the creatures, who are now reaching for the boy and girl, grasping and clawing at their faces as they try to moan through their skin-covered mouths. He gets the car unlocked, and both manage to get inside. As the creatures bang on the windows, the boy starts the engine and drives away, leaving the abominations behind. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-715, also known as my face that I may be. SCP-715 is a take-your-own-photo brand photo booth, a product of the Sony Corporation made in the 1970s. This is a standard-looking photo booth, bearing a close resemblance to the many thousands of others that were in operation around the world at the time, with no anomalous visual characteristics at all. The only detail setting this machine apart from its countless brethren is a small metal tag which has been added to the back of the machine at some point but a significant amount of wear has made it impossible to read what, if anything, was ever stamped on the tag. SCP-715's basic operation is also not anomalous in appearance. It will only activate if an individual sits inside and inserts the required coinage, at which point it will take a series of photos, just like a normal photo booth. The photos will also appear normal, though often some will be heavily distorted and obscure the subject's face in various ways. What truly sets this photo booth apart, however, is what happens outside of the booth when the pictures are taken. While the individuals who had their photos taken, classified as SCP-715-B instances, are able to exit the booth with no obvious effects, below them all, deep underground, something truly terrifying takes place. Underneath the mall is Site-81715 an extra-dimensional space which is accessible through a mall maintenance service door located in sub-basement 3, a door that does not appear on any of the mall's structural blueprints or in other records. The site consists of a giant cavernous room, which appears to have been hewn right out of the surrounding limestone. In the middle of the room is its most distinguishing feature, a large, deep pit. The walls of the pit are made of an unidentified substance, though it appears similar in both appearance and composition to human fat tissue. These fleshy walls secrete a powerful, corrosive substance, which makes examination and exploration of the pit particularly dangerous. When SCP-715 is activated in the mall above, a humanoid creature, classified as SCP-715-A, will appear in this pit. The bodies of these creatures are similar in appearance to the individuals who had their picture taken inside of 715, but their faces are radically different. Each has severe facial disfigurements and abnormalities, such as large growths, deep lacerations, and the absence of facial features. After appearing in the pit, these SCP-715-A instances will attempt to scale the fleshy walls of the pit and leave Site-81-715. These instances are considered hostile, and Foundation security personnel are authorized to neutralize the creatures by any means necessary. Further research into how the SCP-715-A entities are formed and what exactly the pit is are ongoing, and it's not currently known how many 715-A instances exist down in the pit. With the entities who were able to climb out of the pit able to be relatively easily neutralized by security forces, SCP-715 was originally classified as safe. It was contained at its point of origin within the mall in Ohio, and Foundation personnel posing as mall employees would collect the photos printed by the machine. However, following additional discoveries, this classification necessitated changing. The Foundation began noticing inconsistencies with SCP-715-B entities after a researcher tested SCP-715 himself by sitting inside and having his photo taken. Soon after, he began acting in ways that were considered strange, such as when he turned down a promotion to a prominent position with better pay and perks for seemingly no reason, and when he skipped a mandatory site inspection for reality-bending anomalies. After noticing these strange behaviors, a Foundation research head had an anomalous optical enhancement device placed in the oddly acting researcher's bedroom and learned a surprising truth about the SCP-715-A and B entities. 
the Foundation had been killing the wrong ones. The device, which could remove anomalous reality-distorting effects from images, showed that the researcher was actually one of the creatures from the pit, with the telltale facial distortions. Following this shocking revelation, the research head used the same device on the creatures still inside the pit underneath the mall. They found that when the anomalous visual effects were removed from the distorted creatures who were trying to get out of the fleshy pit, that they were actually normal-looking humans. These SCP-715-A entities were the human beings who had entered the photo booth, had their pictures taken, and were somehow transported to the pit. They had been trying to escape their prison and tell the Foundation who they really were, but this only resulted in them being terminated by the on-site security forces. In order to fix this mistake, SCP-715 was hastily reclassified as Keter and SCP-715 was removed from the mall in order to be stored in a secure locker at Site-19. Research personnel were no longer able to access SCP-715 without special authorization, and study of the interior was limited to what could be done via remote drone use only. The Foundation began rounding up all known instances of SCP-715-B who were now the ones subjected to immediate termination. Foundation staff did manage to interview one 715B instance, though, who had been previously believed to be a fellow Foundation researcher. It is unknown exactly what the researcher doppelganger said in that interview, but it must have been extremely serious, as the end result was another complete change in protocol. All attempts to contain and neutralize instances of SCP-715-B would immediately cease, since if there were as many out in the world as the doppelganger claimed, then ultimately, it would better maintain normalcy and ensure the secrecy of SCP-715 if they were allowed to go free. Sadly, the same was not the case for the SCP-715-A instances that still existed down in the pit. The researcher doppelganger advised that it would be unwise to remove them from the pit, and the current Foundation policy is that down in the pit is where they will remain. Following this interview, SCP-715 was reclassified once again as safe. The photo booth was also moved again, this time to a maximum security storage locker at Site-81, and Foundation personnel have been prohibited from interacting with SCP-715-B instances at all. However, there is one more piece of information about SCP-715, and it is only accessible to those with proper security clearance. Another Foundation agent was found to actually be an instance of SCP-715-B and taken into custody for observation. While under surveillance, it was discovered that this instance, classified as SCP-715-B7, was emitting low-level radiation that was somehow directed at Site-81-715, the location of the pit. During an autopsy of the creature, it was found that the radioactive emissions were actually increasing in output and frequency, and soon after, a power outage and containment breach occurred at the site where the autopsy took place. Following these events, the body of SCP-715-B7 disappeared, and video surveillance confirmed that several members of Foundation staff were responsible, all of whom had been involved in SCP-715 research. The staff members escaped with the body and left no other evidence behind, save for a single photo with the ominous text, My ears that I may hear, my eyes that I may see, my mouth that I may speak. Do not touch my face. No other information regarding SCP-715 has been found, and many questions remain. Just what are instances of 715-B, and what do they want? Are they some kind of hive mind colony that reproduces through the use of a mysterious photo booth? What happens to those left behind in the pit? And what will they do should they ever get out? Investigations are ongoing. It's one o'clock in the morning on a work night, and the last of the bar hoppers and club goers have long since turned in. At the end of the street, the last bar is finally closing down for the night. Or it would, except that the bartender is having trouble getting rid of a customer. Sitting at the bar, an old derelict is demanding yet another drink. The bartender grumbles in annoyance. This derelict is sloppy drunk, and the bartender just wants to go home. Closing time, growls the bartender. Just one more, protests the derelict, shaking his empty glass for emphasis. I've got money. 
He laughs at his own words, his giggles ending with a loud belch that blows a cloud of aromatic vapor into the bartender's face. That's it. This derelict has been hanging out at this bar causing trouble all night, and the bartender has had enough. Get out of here, says the bartender as he hustles the wobbling derelict out the door. You're done. The derelict creaks and totters as he stumbles out into the street. The night's festivities are really hitting him. It isn't so often that he's got the money to burn, but when he does, he likes to spend it here. The prices are right, and the conversation is minimal, which is just the way that he likes it. The derelict turns around, fire in his eyes. He's raring to fight, and he doesn't care that the bartender is quite a bit larger than he is. Right now, all he can see is red. Don't tell me why I've had enough, he slurs, raising his fists as he prepares to lash out. But the bartender has already slammed the door in his face. Defeated, the derelict turns his back on the closed bar and starts a slow stumble down the street. Stupid bartender, mutters the derelict, turning up his collar against the cold bite of the night air. He wishes that he just had one more drink to warm his stomach against the chill. He's so out of it that he doesn't stop to think that the bartender did him a favor by refusing to fight. There is no way that the derelict would have won that battle. Even if he was in his physical prime, even if the bartender wasn't twice his size, the derelict is in no shape to fight. His vision is blurry and his head is swimming. In fact, he can barely remain upright. If he had any sense, he would probably stumble home and sleep this off. But the night is young and he's not ready to give up yet. He walks down the street, eyeing every storefront in hopes of finding another bar. Unfortunately, every window has a closed sign in it. He swears under his breath. What a run of bad luck. What's a guy supposed to do in this town, he wonders. Just when he's about to give up hope, he spies something glinting in the reflective halo of a street lamp. He stumbles closer to get a better look, and he can hardly believe his eyes. Finally, his luck is changing. Someone has abandoned a half-empty bottle. Well, hello there, little friend, says the derelict. He struggles to focus, but the world is spinning. In his confusion, he could swear he's seeing things. But no, he can feel the heft of the glass bottle in his hand, and he knows that it is as real as he is. Who left you behind? Who would leave a perfectly good bottle just sitting out here? He recognizes this brand. There's only about three fingers of liquid left, but that's better than nothing. Some people might balk at drinking out of a random bottle that you found on the street, but the derelict doesn't give it a second thought. He tips the bottle back and slurps it all down. It burns going down, just as it should, he thinks. He sighs in contentment as he feels the harsh liquid warm his stomach. Perfect. That really hit the spot. But what happens next surprises him so much that he can't believe his eyes. There's still liquid in the bottle. He blinks, wondering if maybe his adult brain is playing tricks on him. But he shakes the bottle cautiously and is rewarded with a telltale swish of liquid. That's no illusion. He takes another swig, guzzling it down. Normally, he'd drop the bottle to the ground and stumble on, but something makes him pause. He maintains his grip on the bottleneck and raises it again to take another look. And sure enough, there's still more left in the bottle. The derelict cannot believe his luck. He feels like he must have won the lottery. He's found a never-ending bottle. Already his mind is reeling with possibilities. That bartender really thinks he's so smart, he mutters to himself as he weaves unsteadily. But I don't need him anymore. See if I ever go to this stupid bar again. He just lost his best customer. Now that I have you, little bottle, I don't ever need to pay for drinks ever again. <laughs> it's the best day of my life, crows the derelict, raising his arms in triumph. He's barely able to stagger back to his home, a seedy apartment on the bad side of town, before he passes out on the floor. The morning sun rouses the slumbering derelict, and he rises with a groan. His whole body aches, and his mouth feels dry and parched. That's par for the course after a night of drinking, but somehow this hangover feels different. He puts that thought out of his mind as his mind returns to the strange, never-empty bottle that he discovered the night before. It's lying on its side on the floor next to him. He reaches for the mysterious bottle, only to find that, in fact, the previous night was not a dream. The bottle still contains just as much as it did the night before. He can't explain it, but the derelict isn't about to question his good fortune. He lifts himself to his feet and walks slowly into the bathroom. He's feeling a hangover like he's never felt before. His head is pounding and his throat is dry. His tongue feels swollen and sluggish inside his mouth, but he knows how to handle it. A little hair of the dog is all you need to help with the hangover. He takes another gulp from his bottle, but this time it brings little relief. And he notices something else strange, too. It's his scalp. The skin on his head has started to itch, and he can't stop scratching. He feels like he's got the world's worst dandruff problem. 
he should probably take a shower, he thinks. He strips down and steps into the tub, turning the hot water on full blast and letting it wash over him. The shower only brings him temporary relief. Afterward, as he dries himself off, the towels feel rough and abrasive against his skin. His skin comes off in big flaky patches and his nails leave red trails in their wake. What's that? Is that blood? He examines his fingers to see that his nails have grown into ragged claw-like talons. With a frightened yelp, he bites them off. It's easy to do. Although they look formidable, his fingernails are weak and brittle, almost as if he's dealing with a sudden calcium deficiency. What could be wrong with him? He remembers all the warnings he heard back in school when they used to march everyone into assembly to listen to lectures from the local police. At the time, he scoffed at the long lists of scary-sounding consequences of a lifetime of drinking, but now he's not so sure. It's probably nothing, he says as he examines himself in the bathroom mirror. His skin looks blotchy and infected. It doesn't take long before his hair and nails are out of control. His hair grows down to his shoulders, but comes out in big ragged clumps if he runs his fingers through it. His claw-like fingernails are constantly breaking and cracking until his fingertips are bloody, and his quick is itchy and infected. If his habits had left him looking worse for wear before, he really looks awful now. For the next week, he barely leaves the apartment. He pulls the curtains and keeps the lights off, afraid that someone might see him. When the landlord bangs on the door, shouting that rent is late and demanding that the derelict hand over the money, he doesn't answer. He waits. The landlord gives up for now. That's good, thinks the derelict. It will give him time to think, time to figure out what to do about his disease. He knows that something is not right. Many of the local bartenders are, by now, probably wondering where he's gone. It's not like the derelict to stay away. He's practically kept the bar industry in this town afloat all by himself. It must be something major indeed to keep him away from his favorite poison. Luckily, he still has the bottomless bottle to comfort him during this trying time. The derelict is certain that he's caught some bad bug, but he thinks that he can wait it out. All he needs to do is make it through the next week and everything will be fine. Sipping free drinks helps him to pass the time in a pleasant stupor as he waits for his health to return. Unfortunately, things are only going to get worse for him. His hair and fingernails keep growing, to the point that he has trouble lifting the bottle without his twisted nails getting in the way. His dry, flaky skin is changing as well, becoming thick and leathery and hanging off him in great folds like the hide of an elephant or a rhinoceros. His skin continues to grow, until the folds flop over his knees and gradually hang lower and lower until they touch the ground. Moving is harder now that he's carrying so much extra weight. He thought at first he just had a nasty bug, but he's clearly picked up some weird skin condition, and even this derelict, sodded as he might be, suspects exactly where he got it. It's got to be that crazy bottomless bottle. He can't think of another reason. Even so, he can't bring himself to part with this little gift from heaven. Even in his darkest hour, a few sips of liquid courage always helps to calm his nerves. He considers lumbering down to the free clinic in hopes that they might be able to cure him or at least tell him what's wrong with his skin but he thinks better of this option. What if he's got some weird alien parasite that no one has ever seen before? They might lock him away in some government lab or something. No, he reasons, it's better to wait it out. He'll sleep it off, swear off the sauce for a little while, and maybe it'll pass. In desperation, the derelict drags himself across the floor, hoping to at least find some solace away from human contact. He locks himself into his bedroom while he's still able to manipulate the lock on his door. The extra folds of skin are hanging off of his hands and arms, making it hard to do anything. The extra skin is so heavy that he can't walk much carrying all that extra weight. He lies on the floor of his bedroom, away from everything, and hopes that tomorrow, when he wakes up, this will just be a fading dream. The only thing that brings him solace is the never-ending bottle, which even now in his advanced state of decay, he keeps close by him. After all, he reasons, the damage is already done. What could possibly be the harm in enjoying a nice drink? A week later, his condition has not passed. The landlord is back, and this time he's not taking no for an answer. The landlord isn't supposed to enter his tenant's apartment without permission, but he doesn't care. He uses his own key to unlock the door and go inside. The condition of the apartment is appalling. The furniture is broken, the floor is covered with unidentifiable filth, and there's a rotten stench in the air. The landlord wants to throw up as the full weight of the musty smell hits him in the face. It's as if someone has been living in here without any ventilation, with all the windows firmly closed and sealed. A sudden noise from the bathroom draws his attention. Of course, thinks the landlord, that old bum is hiding in there. He thinks I won't find him. The landlord steals his resolve and heads towards the bathroom, determined to get the money that he feels is owed to him. But what greets him when he steps through the door 
isn't the derelict anymore. It isn't even human. The creature in the bathroom is a massive pile of ambulatory skin folds. The skin flaps have grown so large and cumbersome that the derelict within can barely move. They sprout all over his body, covering him so that he looks more like some kind of alien sea cucumber now than any human. The landlord stumbles backwards, screaming in terror at the sight, unable to comprehend what he's looking at. Improbably, the creature reacts to the noise, and a ripple of movement spreads across its surface. It starts to move, despite not having any legs. The landlord is so terrified that he doesn't notice the glass bottle that suddenly drops from between the creature's skin folds as it starts to move toward him. The same bottle, still with three fingers of liquid inside. How could something like this happen? What parasite or disease did the derelict contract from the miracle bottle he found? Sadly, this never-ending bottle isn't a boon, but a curse, and the man who found it that night became just another victim of what the SCP Foundation has classified as SCP-420. SCP-420 looks like a perfectly ordinary bottle of a certain popular libation, even to the point that it bears the label of a common brand. The bottle always contains a small amount of a mysterious liquid known as SCP-420-1. If this liquid is poured out, SCP-420 will always replenish itself. When SCP-420-1 is potent, it is physically, chemically, and molecularly indistinguishable from ordinary whiskey, although drinking will have an effect far greater than even the strongest liquor. When SCP-420-1 is poured out of SCP-420, though, it undergoes a strange transformation, eventually losing its potency and changing until it is indistinguishable physically, chemically, or molecularly from urine. Consuming potent SCP-420-1 instigates a bizarre physical transformation called SCP-420-2 in six stages. In stage one, beginning 12 hours after consumption, the subject will start to have difficulty speaking, resulting in slurred speech that is not consistent with normal alcohol inebriation. Their fingernails, toenails, and hair will start to grow at an accelerated rate, but also become brittle and prone to breakage. Nail breakage to the quick often leads to bleeding and infection. The Foundation has had some success in curing SCP-420-2 if it is caught when still in stage 1, treating it as if it is an aggressive form of cancer with radiation and chemotherapy, as well as a constant intravenous supply of Formula 420A09T-T174B. Victims thus treated have a 73% recovery rate but a 21% fatality rate. From Phase 2 onward, this protocol can slow the spread of SCP-420-2, but will not stop it entirely. In Stage 2, beginning 1-2 to two weeks after Stage 1, the subject's skin begins to show similar properties to those exhibited by hair and fingernails in Stage 1, becoming dry, brittle, and prone to cracking. As old skin flakes off, the subject's new skin begins to grow at an accelerated rate, eventually forming thick leathery folds all over the subject's body. Skin flaps growing inside the mouth interfere with speech and eventually render subjects mute, but do not appear to impede breathing or eating. Indeed, subjects in stage 2 exhibit a renewed interest in eating, possibly because the subject's body requires additional nutrients and calories to build the increasingly heavy armor of thickened, calloused skin. Stage 2 subjects will eat anything that they can get their hands on, and many die after attempting to eat poisonous or inedible objects. In stage 3, beginning 3 to 6 weeks after stage 2, Nerves in the skin layer grow uncontrollably, but no longer connect to the victim's central nervous system. Genetic testing of the skin in this stage reveals that its DNA has become so mutated that it can no longer be classified as human. It is, in fact, a separate and very inhuman organism that almost acts as a parasite growing from the human host. The skin may develop tumor-like growths, which appear to be analogous to human muscle and secretory cells. Hair and fingernails sprout randomly from the mass of skin. By stage 4, beginning 3 to 7 days after stage 3, the skin has become a mass of thick, leathery folds, completely covering the human host to the point that they disappear completely. The skin begins to exhibit random twitching movements, as though it is indeed a living organism finally coming into its own as a life form and testing out its new body. The human subject within the skin continues to eat, although brain scans reveal that they are no longer in control of their mouth. Instead, the skin entity forces the mouth to move by moving the attached skin. Small holes begin to form in the skin, eventually growing into narrow tunnels or throats that lead back to the now trapped body of the helpless subject. The subject is still consumed with a ravenous hunger and will eat anything that they can get in their mouth. In stage 5, beginning 1 to 2 days after stage 4, 
the skin begins to move in patterns, indicating rudimentary intelligence. The skin, although still attached to the original subject, is now completely and distinctly non-human. It is its own organism. It can move of its own accord, dragging the trapped host along for the ride, and it moves and feeds much in the manner of an extremely large amoeba. It feeds by excreting a digestive enzyme onto foodstuffs and then enveloping the nutrients with its skin folds, again like an amoeba surrounding its food. The food is taken into the throats. These tunnels connecting the outside of the skin to the now completely subsumed host are now directly connected to the host's circulatory system and function as additional mouths. They can consume nutrients which are moved down their length by bristly hairs and further broken down by grinding keratinous plates before being taken into the host's body. Most hosts will remain in stage 5 indefinitely, although there still remains a much more dangerous stage 6 yet to come. At this time, it's unknown what factor triggers SCP-420-2 to develop into Stage 6. Little information about Stage 6 is available at this time, although it is known that it involves even more accelerated skin and keratin growth, resulting in a sudden increase in size and mass. Perhaps the most terrifying part of the entire transformation is that the host remains alive for the duration of the process, and sometimes even after SCP-420-2 has settled comfortably into its new life at Stage 5. Mercifully, most hosts will have completely succumbed to insanity by this point, although some are shown by brain scans to still be self-aware and quite calm, perhaps fading into a zen-like state as they accept the inevitability of their fate. SCP-420 is contained in a storage locker at an undisclosed site maintained by the Foundation, and it is only to be removed from this locker by SCP staff with level 3 clearance or higher. It has been given the safe class because, despite the horrifying nature of its effects, at least it doesn't move anywhere. Samples of SCP-420-1 not in use by testing should be stored in the container marked SCP-420-1 Decon in Locker 1014-420 until they lose potency, at which time they can be disposed of as biohazardous liquid waste. Victims infected with SCP-420-2 are not contagious and should be contained in standard solitary D-Class secure confinement. On reaching Phase 3, subjects should receive double rations. Due to the extreme danger of Phase 6, any subjects who reach Phase 4 should be closely monitored for signs that the condition may be advancing further, in which case they are to be immediately destroyed by incineration. Knowing the fate that befalls victims of SCP-420 should make anyone think twice about drinking out of a random bottle that you just found in the street, though personally, I think that's just common sense. A violent storm rocks a merchant ship back and forth. Huge waves roll over the deck and threaten to capsize the vessel. A merchant sailor grips the railing, trying with all his might not to be thrown overboard. With a loud twang, a cable snaps loose. A hand suddenly grabs his shoulder. He turns around with a fright to see that it's one of his shipmates. He points towards the bow of the ship and yells over the roar of the storm that they need to try and repair it. The two men make their way to the front of the ship and the sailor starts working to fix the broken cable. He looks up to see that his mate is no longer working. He's staring straight past him and there's fear in his eyes. The sailor turns around to see a massive tentacle sticking out of the sea. The huge appendage is mind-boggling in its size. He can only stand there, marveling at it, until it begins violently smashing against the deck. The sailor dives out of the way just before the tentacle crashes down right where he was standing, where his crewmate was still locked in fear. The ship is in chaos as more tentacles appear and slam the deck over and over. One cracks the deck right next to him, sending him flying. He comes to moments later in a wreckage pile. Nothing else has changed, though. Whatever this monster is, it's not stopping its assault on the ship. The sailor stands up and picks up a sharpened piece of wood from the pile he was lying in. He runs over to the nearest tentacle and thrusts the sharpened stick into its flesh. There's a mighty roar from the sea, and the tentacles stop their onslaught. They go limp before sliding into the sea. The sailor looks around at the carnage that's been wrought, Dead bodies and debris litter the deck. He moves to check on his crewmates, when right in front of him, bursting from the sea, is the head of the biggest squid he has ever seen, a massive beast that must be a thousand meters long. Whatever he had seen before of this creature was truly just the tip of the iceberg. With another roar, the creature lifts up out of the water and wraps its arms around the ship. 
The sailor only has time to duck down and close his eyes before the entire ship is pulled down beneath the waves. With a gasp, the sailor breaks the surface, screaming and gulping for air. He's alone now, treading water in the middle of the ocean during a storm, but not for long. The squid reappears, its head slowly rising out of the water just in front of him. Its head, the size of a house, has two giant, uncaring black eyes that seem to both see him and not. It extends a tentacle toward him as it leans back in the water, exposing its huge, beaked mouth. It wraps its powerful arms around him and starts to pull him towards it, when suddenly, there's an explosion. The squid has been struck by something. Both the sailor and the creature turn to see the most incredible thing. A battleship is coming towards them, slowly rising out of the ocean as if it were somehow submerged, and it's firing on the creature. The squid drops him and starts heading towards the ship. This is going to be a battle for the ages. While this sailor had no idea what he was witnessing, the SCP Foundation was all too familiar. This was yet another incident of SCP-2846, also known as The Squid and the Sailor. But first, a quick personal request from me. I need your help to spread the word about the lesser-known anomalies in the SCP Foundation's archives. The best thing you can do to help me is subscribe, turn on notifications, and then go tell your friends to do the same. This is a huge help and will let me bring you more and more SCP anomalies. Now back to our file. SCP-2846 is the name given to a set of phenomena that occur in the Gulf Atlantic region. These phenomena consist of interactions between two entities, known as SCP-2846-A and SCP-2846-B. 2846-A is a gigantic, aquatic creature that resembles a cephalopod, though no similar organism has been discovered that is even close to approaching its size, with estimates placing 2846-A at being at least 950 meters in length. This creature appears in areas of deep water during storms and will attack civilian vessels, especially cruise ships and merchant vessels. These attacks are sporadic and follow no known patterns other than that they take place during inclement weather. They are sudden and without warning and will nearly always result in the complete destruction of the targeted vessel if they're not intercepted. Attempting to stop these attacks is SCP-2846-B, a large seafaring vessel that in its current form resembles a Pennsylvania-class super dreadnought battleship, though it appears hazy in photos and videos, as if translucent, and eyewitness observers have described the ship as looking vaporous. Just like SCP-2846-A, this ship will appear from deep water, surfacing near the site of a 2846-A event. The vessel will fire on the creature, drawing its attention, and the two will then engage in a heated battle. The two will continue fighting until SCP-2846-A is rendered immobile or completely incapacitated, after which it will sink down into the sea. Following its victory, the ship too will then submerge and disappear beneath the waves. SCP-2846-A is believed to have existed for thousands of years, and maybe even older than that. The creature's existence was first recorded in an Icelandic saga from the 13th century, but the Foundation's first documented sighting came in 1905, when an agent working for the Foundation, one Admiral Reginald von Allen, spotted the creature surfacing with a whale wrapped effortlessly in its tentacles. Soon after spotting it, a ship of the line surfaced as well to do battle with the creature. The Admiral tried to signal the crew that he could see on the deck of the ship, but the vessel descended back below the surface before any communication could take place. In 1935, the mysterious ship appeared again, near the SCPS Hildegard, and this time, the anomalous vessel was the one to initiate communication. Some of the crew of the ship, designated as SCP-2846-B1 through B915, came aboard the Foundation ship and engaged in a conversation with Captain Levy Hansen. SCP-2846-B1 identified himself as David Thomas Jones of the Royal Navy and went on to explain that their ship had been sunk by a monster resembling SCP-2846-A over 300 years in the past. He described how after sinking into the darkness of the sea, he awoke on a mysterious shore where he met with a woman who referred to herself as Calypso, the goddess of the sea. She explained how she had sealed the leviathans that prowled the depths of the ocean in a pit, but that over time, the seal she had placed on it had begun to weaken. A titan had escaped and taken the form of the most deadly creature in the sea. 
the Kraken. Calypso feared that the creature would attempt to further destroy the seal and release its monstrous brethren, a disaster that would result in the end of all human life. She requested that Jones pursue the creature along with his crew for as long as needed, and in return, they would be granted immortality. Jones agreed, and his endless battle against the anomaly began that day. The reason he had now come aboard a Foundation ship was directly related to this task. SCP-2846-A had grown more powerful over the years, larger and bolder too. He and his men couldn't die, but many more would if they were no longer able to subdue the beast. He needed something from the SCP Foundation. He needed a bigger boat. Following this conversation, and seeing the value in allowing Jones and his crew to continue their mission, the Foundation commandeered a newly built Pennsylvania-class Super Dreadnought battleship from the U.S. Navy, the USS Montana. The ship was sunk 15 kilometers from a Foundation naval facility in Cuba. Thirty hours later, the ship surfaced from the sea, though it was now more heavily armed than the USS Montana had been. As part of the agreement, SCP-2846-B was fitted with an explosive device that is capable of completely destroying the ship should the crew for some reason ever turn their guns on Foundation or other human targets. In 2013, an important discovery was made after a tracker was attached to SCP-2846-A. Deep in the Atlantic, roughly 1,300 nautical miles west of Florida, a depression in the ocean floor with a large iron object on top of it was found. 2846 seems to return to this site over and over, where it has been observed clearing the rocks from the area. And it appears that it is almost finished with its task. The iron plate on top of the depression is nearly exposed. It's not known exactly what's underneath, but whatever it is, it's hot. Very hot, with temperatures near it measured at over 4,000 degrees Celsius. It's feared that whatever the creature is trying to unearth, it would lead to an XK end-of-the-world scenario, and it is imperative that it not be allowed to do so. And there's more bad news when it comes to SCP-2846. In 2014, the Foundation ship SCPS Pristine was pursuing a large underwater organism assumed to be SCP-2846-A, and signaled to 2846-B to surface and dispatch the creature in what had become the normal operating procedure. Something strange happened, though and the pristine was suddenly struck by a mysterious force. As SCP-2846-B began to engage with the now-surfaced 2846-A, the crew of the pristine reported seeing numerous eyes appearing and disappearing in the water below the ship. They had never seen anything like it. The ship was struck again, as satellite images spotted an enormous entity directly beneath the ship. The pristine began taking on water, and the crew was forced to abandon ship. Two other SCP ships in the area fired on the strange, many-eyed entity, causing it to once again disappear into the depths of the ocean, as SCP-2846-B banished 2846-A to the ocean once again. Due to the ongoing danger of SCP-2846-A, it has been classified as Keter. In the event of an appearance, Mobile Task Force Tau-11, also known as the Can Openers, who are stationed aboard the SCPS Nikolai, are to utilize a special transmission device to signal the crew of SCP-2846-B and maintain contact with them throughout their engagement with the creature. Tau-11's primary mission is to minimize civilian exposure to the anomaly, and any non-Foundation ships that come in contact with either 2846 entity are to be moved from the area, and all aboard the craft are to be given Class C amnestics. The SCPS Nikolai's captain has been given permission to fire on SCP-2846-A to assist in the fight, and should 2846-B turn hostile for any reason, the explosive device on board is to be detonated. It is still unknown just what the entity that attacked and destroyed the SCPS Pristine was, but the ease with which it dispensed of the vessel has many in the Foundation worried that SCP-2846-A has already been able to release one of its brethren from its prison, and at this point, stopping them may no longer be an option. It's late on a Saturday night in New York City. 11.55 p.m. to be exact. A man is running towards the subway station on 59th Street. He's just gotten off from work at the restaurant where he waits tables, and he's in a hurry to get home and spend some time with his girlfriend. As he approaches the station, he notices something strange. Someone has placed a wooden barrier in front of the entrance. The man has never seen something like this before, but he hasn't lived in Brooklyn very long. Everything about the station looks normal behind the barrier, and he's in a hurry. He doesn't want to have to go several blocks to the next station, so he hops the barrier. 
What's the worst that could happen? As the man walks onto the train platform, he starts to second guess his decision. The platform is empty. And come to think of it, he hasn't seen anyone in the station at all. Maybe he did make a mistake. Maybe the station really is closed for repairs. He turns around to leave, but just as he does, he hears a train. Good, everything is normal. He checks his watch, 11.57 p.m. on the dot. The train comes to a stop and its doors slide open. It looks a little older than the trains he usually rides, but it appears to be in perfect shape, and it's going the direction of his home, so he steps on board. Just like the station and the platform, there's no one else on the train. Strange, but he's ridden nearly empty trains before, especially late at night, though usually at this time on a Saturday there's at least a few people on board. Just then, he hears something in the station. He turns to see someone running down the platform crying out. Stop, stop, the man in the mass transit authority vest cries, dropping what looks to be his dinner on the platform as he runs. While the MTA worker is still several feet away, the doors snap shut and the train begins to move. The MTA worker cries out again to stop, but he knows there's no point. He watches as the train heads down the tracks and disappears into the darkness. With a sigh, he takes out a walkie-talkie and it squawks to life. We've lost another one, he says. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-052, also known as the Time Traveling Train. SCP-052 appears to be a standard-looking Type R4 New York City subway train. Official city records state that the train was built in 1932 and decommissioned for scrap in 1975. Despite the fact that it should no longer exist, SCP-052 continues to appear on the Uptown AD track at the 59th Street and 8th Avenue station at exactly 11.57 p.m. every Saturday night. The train appears to be in perfect condition, just the same as when it was built over 80 years ago, and it is marked as an A-train. Each Saturday, the train arrives at exactly the same time, opens its doors to accept or discharge passengers for precisely five minutes then closes its doors and disappears until the next week. Where did the train come from? And where does it go in between the weekly appearances? These are questions the SCP Foundation is trying to answer. But perhaps the most frightening aspect of SCP-052 is that once you get on the train, there's no guarantee of ever getting off. Sadly, the majority of subjects that have been observed boarding SCP-052 have not been heard from again. The rare few that have been recovered claim to have boarded the train on various dates, ranging from 1976 all the way to the year 2204, with the latter claiming he thought he was boarding a special 300th anniversary train. Thus far, none of the recovered passengers have reported any memories or knowledge of their time on board the train between entering and exiting. Any passengers spotted disembarking from SCP-052 are to be immediately brought to Site-21 for questioning to determine their origin and assess whether they pose any threat to the current time stream. The Foundation has had great success administering Class A amnestics to passengers who arrived from the past and reintegrating them into society. But any passenger who is identified as being from the future must be held indefinitely to prevent potential disruptions to this reality's time stream, per Order 69-A1 from 05 Council Member 05-9. There are currently 26 recovered passengers being held at Site-21 who fit this description, and there are not yet any procedures in place that would allow for their safe release into modern society, nor has there been any workable theories for how to return them to their original home time. Despite the protocols in place to prevent public access, some passengers from the present have still managed to accidentally board SCP-052, and subjects from other times continue to appear. Following interviews, it's been discovered that some of these subjects arrive from alternate timelines and realities. This raises the question of whether it is possible for SCP-052 to appear in other times and places, which may require the containment of additional locations, and reports of any suspicious activity involving unscheduled trains are being monitored and investigated around the world. Following its initial discovery, Several tests were attempted in order to better understand the anomalous train and what may be happening when it is no longer visible. The first test took place on May 31st, 2009. An agent was told to simply board the train. They did as requested and have yet to be recovered as of the present date. A second test took place a week later on June 6th. This agent too was never recovered. 
though reports indicate that he may have returned to our timeline in 1980, at which point he was killed in a confrontation that has since been classified. A third test was conducted the next week on June 13th. Once again, the agent was told to board the train and did so. This time, though, the agent returned. Just two weeks later, on June 27th, the agent stepped back off the train, with his hands appearing to have been surgically removed. A note had been placed in his pocket that had the simple message, Send No More, written on it. The agent claims not to remember any of his experiences on the train over the two weeks he was gone, or what may have happened to his hands. Following this third test, O5 Command issued orders stopping the use of Foundation agents as passengers on SCP-052. D-Class, due to their disposable nature as convicted felons and death row inmates, were considered as potential replacements for the agents in the exploration of SCP-052, but the risk of releasing them into the past, or the future, was determined to be too great. Other than the agent who knowingly boarded the train, several other notable passengers have been recovered. One case involved the recovery of a woman who entered the train on July 14, 2012, but was recovered four years earlier, on March 8, 2008. She entered the train while on her way home from the theater, and was surprised to learn she traveled four years into the past. Because another version of her existed at the time she was recovered, she was held to prevent unwanted temporal effects. Another subject was recovered in 2008 who claimed to be from the year 1976. Although there was nothing physically wrong with him and no risk of time stream disruptions, Foundation psychiatrists recommended that he be held indefinitely, as 32 years was believed to be too long a period of time to successfully reintegrate into society. Perhaps the most interesting recovery was of a man claiming to be a Level 4 supervisor from the SCP Federation, who boarded the train in December of 2124. He said that he had been administered a Class A amnestic prior to boarding, and remembered nothing until his recovery in 2010. While the agent can clearly never be released into society, O5 Command has approved the sharing of classified information about various anomalies, in the hopes that he can provide additional information on possible containment procedures. Because SCP-052 has so far proven impossible to stop or remove from the New York City subway system, it has been classified as Euclid but its predictable nature means that the Foundation is usually able to prevent the public from encountering it. The 59th Street ABCD station is closed to the public between 11 p.m. on Saturday night and 1 a.m. on Sunday morning, under the pretext of track maintenance. Any passengers seen leaving SCP-052 must be taken to Site-21 for debriefing and processing, and members of the public who simply see SCP-052 may be released after the administration of a Class B amnestic. As for what happens to most of the passengers who board SCP-052 and are never seen from again, we simply don't know. A young man tosses and turns in bed. He adjusts his pillow and tries sleeping on his back, his side, his stomach, but nothing works. He rolls over to check the time, 3 a.m. This is the third night in a row he hasn't been able to fall asleep. He feels tired. He wants to sleep. But every time he closes his eyes and sleep starts to creep in, something happens, and suddenly, he's wide awake again. It's as if someone keeps flipping a switch in his brain to awake, and there's nothing he can do to stop it. It's affecting everything in his life. He can't concentrate in class, his work performance goes down the drain, even his hobbies become completely unenjoyable. All he wants to do is sleep. His friends and family can tell something is wrong. It's as if he has become a different person, and they urge him to go see a doctor. But the doctors tell him there's nothing they can do for him. He's perfectly healthy otherwise. He should try some natural remedies like valerian root and get more exercise. He has no idea how many days he's been awake now. Four? Five? Maybe more? At this point, the lack of sleep isn't even the worst part. It's the hallucinations. Sometimes they're just a shadow dancing outside of his vision but others are incredibly vivid, feeling more real than his now dreary life does. He had to stop going to work and class entirely since he can't concentrate for more than a couple of seconds at a time. His friends don't want anything to do with him, and who can blame them? He has uncontrollable mood swings and lashes out for no reason. He's tried every sleep remedy there is. He took the doctor's advice and exercised as hard as he ever has. 
but with never being able to sleep, he has no energy left. He's becoming a living zombie. He gets up out of bed, but loses his balance and collapses to the floor. He tries to get up, but he can't. He'll just lie there for a while. He starts to drift away, and he readies himself for the jolt that always wakes him back up. But this time, it doesn't come. The wave of sleep that starts to wash over him feels different this time, though. It's heavier, more peaceful, and more permanent. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-966, also known as Sleep Killer. SCP-966 is the designation that the SCP Foundation has given to a creature that belongs to a group of anomalous predatory beasts, standing 1.4 to 1.6 meters tall and weighing roughly 30 kilograms. These hairless humanoids have an elongated face, a mouth full of pointed needle-like teeth, and each of their hands has five razor-sharp claws that can be up to 20 centimeters in length. Though unlike humans and apes, they are digitigrade, meaning that they walk using only their toes. But you won't be able to see the horrible visage of SCP-966 under normal circumstances, as they are only visible under very specific lighting conditions. They can only be viewed under light that has a wavelength between roughly 700 and 900 nanometers, which is just at the edge of the light spectrum that's visible to humans, stretching into what's known as infrared light. The only exception to this is if their skin, muscles, or organs have suffered from second or third degree burns, in which case, the affected areas of their body will show up under a greater spectrum of wavelengths that are visible to the human eye. Though frightening to look at, SCP-966 are actually quite weak physically, with very low muscular density. Their bones are hollow, similar to birds, and while their claws may be incredibly sharp, they are also easily broken, making them unsuited for use in combat. Additionally, they do not rest through sleep, but will, at seemingly random times, stop all movement and fall into a rest period that lasts roughly three to five minutes, after which they are able to resume their normal behavior. With all of these physical shortcomings, how did SCP-966 gain a reputation as such a fearsome hunter? The secret lies in their ability to emit bursts of a previously unknown type of wave. Hunting either alone or in pairs, SCP-966 uses this wave to inhibit its prey's ability to enter any of the restful sleep stages and also stops the ability to micro-sleep. These waves have been observed to be effective at up to 20 meters, though tests have shown that they can be blocked by post-transition metals, of which lead appears to be especially effective. SCP-966 hunts and feeds on medium to large-sized animals, which includes humans, and once their quarry has been targeted by the sleep-inhibiting waves, the effect is permanent with no method having yet been discovered that will allow them to regain the ability to sleep. Experiments have shown that unconsciousness can be induced in other ways, such as with the use of general anesthesia, though these methods have ultimately proven to be ineffective, since although the victim is unconscious, they are still not receiving any of the restful benefits of sleep while in that state. The effects of sleep deprivation on humans, both mentally and physically, are devastating. Symptoms can begin setting in after just 24 hours that can include mood swings, memory issues, and sensory impairment. After two to three days, the body's hormones become deregulated, and bodily functions like hunger, thirst, and temperature fluctuate wildly as cognitive abilities start to dramatically decline. Hallucinations, paranoia, and fits of rage are common, and the risk of death from sleep deprivation increases with each day that passes without sleep. And this is exactly what SCP-966 wants. After surreptitiously sending a burst of sleep deprivation waves at their victim, they will then stalk their prey until lack of sleep finally leads to total incapacitation, at which point SCP-966 consumes them. SCP-966 have proven to be both extremely quiet and agile when hunting. However, they have actually been observed intentionally making threatening noises around their prey presumably to further increase their already elevated stress levels and potentially hastening their mental degradation. On rare occasions, they will even physically assault their victim to further degenerate their mental and physical health. Some of SCP-966's prey will experience especially intense hallucinations and bouts of rage, 
which is theorized to be caused by prolonged exposure to multiple instances of their sleep-stopping waves. Why some victims are exposed to multiple waves when a single instance has been shown to be 100% effective is unknown, and it's hypothesized that they may only engage in this behavior when especially hungry, to try and speed up the process. Though others have put forth the theory that SCP-966 may take some perverse form of joy in seeing its victims suffer prior to expiring. Wild instances of SCP-966 have been found across the globe, and while the SCP Foundation has been successful in thinning their numbers, they still exist in high enough numbers to pose a serious threat to humanity. For these reasons, they have been assigned the classification Euclid. Mobile Task Forces IOTA-1 and IOTA-2, codenamed the Dream Hunters and Air Chasers respectively, are continually monitoring for any reports of sudden or violent deaths related to sleep deprivation in order to identify and neutralize the remaining instances of wild SCP-966. Four SCP-966 specimens, three males and one female, have been acquired by the Foundation, and they are currently contained in a 10 by 10 meter room that is lined with lead and equipped with infrared security cameras. Each specimen is fed 20 kilograms of meat each month, and in the event that the female specimen gives birth, the new specimen is to be taken for observation and study before being disposed of prior to reaching maturity. An SCP Foundation doctor wearing a hazmat suit is escorted by two guards through the secure facility. They stop in front of a large, sealed door, and one of the guards scans his security card. There's an audible hiss as the door slides open. The doctor nervously looks to the guard who motions him inside. They certainly won't be joining him. The doctor steps into the small airlock, and the door snaps shut. A complicated locking mechanism seals the door behind him. He's truly locked in. The reverse process then begins on the locked door in front of him. It finishes, and the door opens, revealing a room with bright lights that briefly blind the doctor. As his eyes adjust, he can see that the entire room is white and bathed in an intense light. He steps out of the airlock and towards the center of the room where his task awaits. He takes one slow step at a time, pausing for a moment after each before taking the next. The doctor wants to get this over with as quickly as possible, but he has to abide by the protocols, and this is how they dictate that one must walk in this containment chamber. As the doctor gets closer to the center, and his eyes further adjust to the bright light, he can finally see what this room contains. In the very middle of the room, directly under the lights, is a man. He's lying on a table and isn't moving at all, except for his slow, rhythmic breathing, which is assisted by the ventilator he's connected to. A feeding tube has been placed inside his nose, and numerous machines next to the man hum and beep as they measure his vital signs. The doctor continues to take one slow step after another, and eventually, after what feels like an eternity, he reaches the middle of the room. The lights above the man are angled to create large, dark shadows coming off of him, and now the doctor is finally close enough to make out what he was warned about in his briefings. Even though the man is completely still, the shadows are moving. Scurrying on the edges of the man's shadow are what look to be spiders, and big ones too, roughly three inches across. But the doctor can't see any actual spiders on the man. Only the shadows of these massive arachnids are visible as they move back and forth along the man's shadow. The doctor is growing increasingly nervous. He can feel the sweat dripping down the inside of his hazmat suit, though he tries to tell himself it's just a result of the bright lights beating down on him. The doctor reaches the machines measuring the man's vital signs and jots down their readings, marking down that the man's medically induced coma appears stable. He's continually distracted from his work, though, by the movement of the spiders. One suddenly jumps from one part of the man's shadow to another, startling the doctor and causing him to jump back. The spiders abruptly stop moving, and even though he can't see their eyes, he has the feeling that they are looking right at him. The doctor is frozen with fear, staring right back at the spiders. But after a moment, they go back to their previous behavior and start crawling along the edge of the comatose man's shadows once more. The doctor continues to go down his checklist and audibly gulps. He's reached the final item, the one labeled physical exam. Nervous sweat runs down his face into his eyes, and he wishes he wasn't wearing this hazmat suit so he could wipe it off. He knows he must get much closer to the man, and more importantly, his shadow, than he feels comfortable with. He has to physically take the man's pulse, though. They won't let him out of this room if he doesn't. 
He reaches out towards the man's hand, slowly and carefully. He can see the shadow of his hand getting dangerously close to the man's shadow, and the spider's. One of the spiders stops moving, as if it is watching and waiting for the doctor's shadow to get closer. It raises up on its hind legs, looking like it is ready to pounce. The doctor gets closer and closer to the man's hand, when out of nowhere, the room is rocked by an explosion. The doctor spins around, and on a monitor next to the airlock door, he can see a feed of the hallway outside. The guards who had escorted him run down the hall as a red emergency light flashes. He turns back to the man on the table. The spider that was waiting for him lowers itself out of its attack mode and goes back to scurrying along the shadow. The room is shaken by an even bigger explosion, and it suddenly goes dark. The power must have gone out from whatever is happening outside. He can hear the sound of muffled gunfire mixed with far-off screams, but both are drowned out by his nervous, heavy breathing inside of the suit. The doctor drops to the ground and tries to crawl back to the door, but he has no idea which direction it is. He hits his head hard and hears a crack come down his mask. That must have been the table. The doctor turns and crawls the other direction, eventually finding the airlock door. He stands up and bangs and pulls on the door, but it won't move. He fumbles with his hazmat suit and finds the button for his emergency light. A chemical light comes on inside of his suit, casting his face in a sickly yellow light. But the light starts to flicker. Something must be malfunctioning. The light on one side of his protective mask goes out, leaving half of his face in darkness. But that's the least of his problems, because all of his attention is now focused on the shadow moving across his face. It's the shadow of a spider. His eyes go wide as the spider stops and stands up on its rear legs. Arachnophobia, the fear of spiders, and sciophobia, the fear of shadows, are some of the most common phobias, and today's SCP file is a terrifying and dangerous combination of both. I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-538, also known as the Shadow Spiders. SCP-538 is what appears to be a kind of living shadow, not dissimilar to SCP-017, though these shadows always take the form of an unknown species of spider. These anomalous arachnids seek out the shadows cast by other living objects, attaching themselves to the edge of the living creature's shadow in such a way that their own shadows aren't obscured. Once attached to a shadow, the spiders will appear to feed off of them. This allows them to rapidly grow in size, with adults measuring a total area of roughly 15 square centimeters. Once they reach their full size, they will continue to feed, though this will only maintain their size. The feeding process seems to not impact the host in any way, and the spiders can remain on a shadow indefinitely. While the spiders have been observed feeding on the shadows of inanimate objects when no living creatures are available, these don't appear to provide the spiders with whatever nutrients they require and they will slowly atrophy and decrease in size. It is only when they are connected to the shadow of a living organism that SCP-538 can thrive. SCP-538 are not locked to the shadow they are on, though. The spiders have shown the ability to move across areas to reach a new host, though they will decrease in size when not attached to a shadow, losing as much as two square centimeters of their size for every second that they aren't on a shadow. And should they be stranded in the open without a shadow to feed on, they will decrease in size until they disappear completely, at which point that individual instance of SCP-538 is considered to be terminated. The spiders normally avoid this fate thanks to their extremely fast movement though, and fully grown instances have been measured moving up to 1 meter per second. While SCP-538 instances are usually quite benign, seeming content to simply live on the shadow of their host, they will attack if they are frightened which is when the real danger presented by these anomalous arachnids comes to light. If the spiders are agitated, usually from the result of a rapid movement by its host, the spider will bite the organism's shadow before attempting to flee. Once bitten, the unlucky individual will progress through five distinct stages, all of which take place over the course of roughly one hour. During the first, the subject will report pain in the area of their body that corresponds to the part of their shadow that was bitten but no puncture wounds or other marks will be visible in this location. Minor psychological effects have been reported in this stage, mostly consisting of an increase in irritability and the tendency for the bitten subject to lash out at those around them. The second stage occurs 10 to 15 minutes after being bitten. The subject will begin sweating, despite reporting that they feel cold, while their skin will become red and warm to the touch. 
25 to 30 minutes after the bite, the third stage will begin. At this point, the psychological effects become very noticeable, with the subject becoming violent and attempting to attack any person nearby. Their speech will be slurred, and they may show signs of impairment to their motor skills. The fourth stage begins at the 40 to 45 minute mark, and at this point, the subject's skin color will go from being red to a pale white as their core temperature drops 5 to 8 degrees Celsius. Their psychological state will alter once again, and they will go from being extremely aggressive to overly apologetic, blaming their previous behavior on the fact that they weren't feeling well and weren't acting like themselves. After offering their apologies, they will then request their leave from the area and attempt to retreat to a darkened area. The fifth and final stage happens 55 to 60 minutes after the bite, at which point the subject faces a grisly end to the entire ordeal. Their entire body will rapidly dissolve into a translucent liquid, while at the exact same time, their shadow will disintegrate into numerous smaller instances of SCP-538. The spider offspring measure just 4 centimeters across, and the new instances will immediately begin seeking out shadows of their own that they can attach to and feed off of. There is currently no known cure for being bitten by an SCP-538 instance, and even death will not halt the process. Instead, should the subject expire while in the earlier stages of the condition, death will cause the final step to occur immediately. In a bit of good news, only bites to the area of an individual's shadow that correspond to a spot of bare skin seem to cause these effects. Even thin materials like cotton clothing appear to be enough to prevent the process from starting. The SCP Foundation has multiple instances of SCP-538 in containment, and they are kept in a white 15x15x3 15 by 15 by meter room that is accessible only via an airlock. Four 200-watt lights are focused on a table in the center of the room, where D-Class personnel in a medically induced coma is kept in a stable state, in order to serve as a feeding source for the SCP-538 specimens. No other sources of shade are allowed into the room, so that the D-Class serves as the only source of shadows. Any personnel that enter the room, whether to repair a light source or to check on the condition of the D-Class, are to wear sealed hazardous material suits equipped with oxygen tanks, and are advised that they must move slowly and deliberately in order to avoid agitating any instances of SCP-538. Initially, doctors sent to examine the D-Class personnel were allowed to enter the room alone. However, following the events of Incident I-538-1, that protocol has been changed. During the incident, an attack by the Chaos Insurgency caused disruptions to both the main and backup power sources to the part of the site where the SCP-538 containment cell is located. Just as a Foundation doctor was in the middle of an examination of the comatose D-Class, power outage led to all lights in the containment cell shutting off, while at the same time sealing the airlock that provides the only means in or out of the room and trapping the doctor inside. The power was not able to be restored to the containment cell for another 18 hours, at which point the doctor was finally removed from the cell. The doctor sobbed uncontrollably as he kept repeating that he could feel them crawling all over him. The doctor was required to attend mandatory psychological therapy for his newly developed arachnophobia and was later reassigned. Following this incident, the examination protocol was updated and health checkups of the D-Class personnel are now performed by a doctor who is accompanied in the cell by two security personnel, each of whom are equipped with two 250-watt flashlights that can be used in the event of another disruption to the lights. If at any time a staff member is bitten by one of the spiders, they are to be immediately placed within SCP-538's containment cell as soon as possible, as the failure to properly contain them could easily lead to a massive containment breach by SCP-538 entities. Bitten individuals will often attempt to hide the fact that they are bitten, so anyone who comes into contact with the shadow spiders must be carefully monitored for signs of any of the symptoms that follow a bite. The ease with which they could quickly spread and the huge threat they pose to humanity has led to SCP-538 being classified as Euclid, and while the Foundation hopes that they have been successfully contained, we all must remain ever vigilant of movement on the edge of shadows. Should you spot something, don't take any chances. Your future, non-liquefied body will thank you for it. A pair of urban explorers are standing in front of a rather creepy-looking public school building. One explains to the other that it has been abandoned for years, though no one in the town seems to know exactly why. The two pull a board off one of the windows and climb through. The inside looks pretty much like they were expecting. 
Their flashlights reveal that years of squatters, teens partying, and wild animals have left plenty of refuse and debris lying around. There are two wings branching off the central portion of the building. They pick one of them to explore and start walking down the hall. As they make their way down past the graffiti-tagged walls, they stop to investigate one of the classrooms. It looks to be in the same bad state as the rest of the building, but incredibly, they're still writing on the chalkboard, as if the teacher stopped in the middle of a lesson and walked out. There's even a shriveled old apple still on the desk. As they exit the classroom back into the hallway, one of them stops. Wasn't the graffiti on the wall different before? Impossible, they must be mistaken. They keep walking and come to a stairwell. Time to explore the upper floors. They head up the stairs to the second floor and poke their head out. Everything looks to be about the same as on the first floor. They go back into the stairwell and start heading up again. It feels like they've been walking up the stairs for a long time, though. They should be all the way at the roof by now. They finally reach a door. It must lead to a taller part of the building they couldn't see from the ground outside. They open the door and see… the second floor again. How could this be? The two look at each other. They have explored a lot of strange abandoned places, but nothing has creeped them out like this before. They head back down the stairs, and after only a few steps, they are back on the first floor. Something is really wrong with this place. Maybe it's best if they leave. They start walking back towards the entrance, but one grabs the other and points into a classroom. Isn't this the room they went in before? It has to be. The same apple is on the desk, but the complicated physics lesson has been erased. Now the chalkboard has just a simple phrase written on it. The children used to sing. The two scream and run out of the classroom, but which way is the entrance? The hall appears to stretch on in either direction before turning at 90 degree angles. This isn't right. The entrance was definitely visible from outside the classroom before. They pick a direction and start to run. The hallways seem to go on and on, turning in ways that should double back on themselves, but they still can't find the entrance. They try going back up through a stairwell, but just like before, there appears to be either too many or not enough stairs between the floors. The explorers keep running, checking rooms for a way out. Somehow they keep finding that same room with the rotten apple on the desk. They're panicking now. Every time they look away, the graffiti on the wall changes, or a new classroom door appears in the hall. They keep running, though, turning corner after corner after corner until… there it is, the entrance. But it's then that one of the explorers realizes he is all alone. He must have outran his friend. He looks at the entrance. It's so close. He starts to step towards it, but no. He can't leave his friend. He'll find him. He turns around and right in front of him is the same classroom again. The one with the apple. Only this time, his friend is in there, sitting in a desk in the middle of the room, asleep. Gathering the last of his courage, he runs into the room and tries to wake his friend, but he won't come out of his deep sleep. He pulls him out of the desk. If he won't walk out, he'll drag him out. He pulls him out of the classroom and down the hall towards the entrance. They're almost home free. He's just feet away from the door. He reaches out with his free hand and grabs the handle. Locked. He starts banging on the door, terrified that they'll be trapped in this place forever. When suddenly, the doors swing open. Two stern-looking men in suits are standing in front of him. You aren't supposed to be here, one of the men says, as the other picks up his friend, throws him over his shoulder, and escorts the both of them out of the school. What these urban explorers didn't know is that they had just unintentionally entered a mysterious anomaly that the SCP Foundation has designated SCP-026, a strange location that has been given the nickname After School Retention. SCP-026 is a three-story building that used to be a public school prior to it being shut down and condemned after both staff and students reported various anomalous properties in the building. They described hallways that seemed to change in length, classrooms disappearing and reappearing, and stairways with different numbers of steps leading up and down. The discrepancies between the building's blueprints and the reported interior were strange enough, but the former school truly came onto the Foundation's radar after the disappearances of multiple people in the area were linked to the location. It was initially believed, after sending in robots equipped with video equipment to explore the school, that the spatial anomalies were actually caused by an anomalous mental effect the space was having on people's perception, and that the physical layout of the school was not actually changing. However, additional exploration has proven that this is not the case. 
The physical space of the school does in fact seem to change, and even the exploration robots are affected by this shifting geometry. The inside of the school is covered in a substantial amount of graffiti, and most of it is the type you'd expect to see in any abandoned space. Gang signs, names, and street art, for example. But it appears to fade in and out, and will change location. The writing on the chalkboards in the classroom appears to do the same, and just like the graffiti, much of what is written on the chalkboards is what you would expect to find in a school. Most of the writing relates to basic subjects like math, literature, and biology. However, some of the subjects that have appeared are highly advanced and out of place in a non-university setting, such as the notes on quantum entanglement that were found on a chalkboard. Bizarrely, the phrase, the children used to sing, has been found multiple times in a variety of places around the building though researchers are still left without an answer as to what it means or what significance it holds. But the anomalous nature of the writing inside of SCP-026 doesn't stop there. The written content of books, notepads, and other pieces of paper brought into the school have been observed to disappear, leaving blank pages behind, only for the writing to reappear as graffiti or on the chalkboards. It is unknown why or how this is happening. But those working within SCP-026 are advised to be careful of what written materials they bring inside. Multiple unconscious persons have also been found in the building. Several of the people found in the school have been identified as either former students or faculty of the school, including teachers and janitors, all of whom had been reported missing in the years following the school's closure. Despite some of them disappearing as long as 10 years after the school closed, when they are found inside SCP-026, they appear much younger than they should be, with the majority being high school aged and dressed in the style of the school's dress code in the time before it was shut down. It is currently not known how they ended up inside of SCP-026 or why they present as being a younger version of themselves. Attempts to wake unconscious people while still inside the school are always unsuccessful. However, once they are transported outside of SCP-026, they will immediately awaken. All have displayed signs of confusion in their brief moments of consciousness, before quickly dying from what appears to be severe dehydration. Their bodies will then experience rapid advanced decomposition. No useful information on the nature of SCP-026 has been gleaned from any of these subjects in the brief period after removing them from the school that they are conscious and alive. There have also been several cases of D-Class personnel who had participated in SCP-026 research disappearing from Foundation control, only to be found within the school at a later date. All are found sleeping, and experience the same fate as the others who mysteriously appear within the school. The same inability to wake up while inside the school appears to also apply to those who enter SCP-026 and fall asleep, though they do not suffer the same gruesome fate upon being removed from the site and waking. Such was the case for a Foundation agent who, during a routine security check of the site, was found sleeping in the entranceway of the school by his partner. They were unable to wake the agent up, and he was moved outside the building. As soon as he was outside of SCP-026, the agent regained consciousness and appeared to be in a state of extreme agitation. In later interviews, he reported that he had dreamed he was in a strange classroom, and the same dream has been reported by all subjects who have fallen asleep in the school as well as by the D-Class personnel who were later found inside. They all describe that in the dream, they are sitting inside of a classroom that closely resembles those found in SCP-026, though in the dream it is in a condition that matches how it likely appeared while it was still a functioning school. The bell rings but no one moves, and raising their hand does not get the teacher's attention. Everyone is just sitting silently. If they try to leave the classroom, they find the doors locked. They then notice what is really off about the dream. Everything is in black and white, except for the dreamer who looks down at their own hands and realizes that they are in color. Just as they begin to realize that they are dreaming and that they are the one who is out of place, they wake up. This dream will persist, recurring over and over, and each time it takes the dreamer longer and longer to realize that they are dreaming. They also notice each time that their hands are a little more gray. Research into SCP-026 is ongoing, and all potential entrances, including both doors and windows, are to remain locked and boarded up in between investigative missions. Alarms have been placed around the location to alert Foundation personnel in the event that civilians or any other unauthorized personnel gain entry to the site. Due to the fact that even with these precautions, people continue to be found within SCP-026, 
and there has not yet been a reliable way discovered to prevent it, this anomaly has been classified as Euclid. While you do not appear to be at risk of any serious danger if you have not previously fallen asleep in SCP-026, pay attention to your dreams, and if at any time you find yourself back in a classroom setting where things seem, well, off, contact the nearest SCP Foundation personnel to receive Class A amnestics in order to minimize any risk of you experiencing an after-school retention. High in the Andes Mountains, two miners chip away at the rock with their mining picks in search of precious minerals when something strange happens. They hit an impenetrable wall. As they dust off the unbreakable surface they've reached, they see that it's a mirrored sheet of some strange metal. They start to break away the rock around it, revealing more and more of the shiny metallic surface until it suddenly disappears as if by magic. Behind it is a chamber with strange machinery and a mysterious metallic ball inside. The two miners look at each other in disbelief. What on earth had they just discovered? Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-163, also known as an old castaway. The Foundation soon caught word of the bizarre object that had been unearthed in the Andes Mountains, and immediately sent agents to secure the site. When they arrived, they found the metallic sphere was still there, though approximately 30% of the machinery originally reported to have been in the chamber had been looted before they could get there. Based on analysis of the rock strata in which it was found, the chamber appeared to be many, many years old, and tests on the minerals present showed signs of a shockwave, indicating that whatever this was, it had crash-landed into the mountains. Upon examination of the metallic sphere, the agents found that it was a kind of machine and one with a relatively simplistic interface. The agents deactivated the machine and were met with an amazing discovery. The mirrored ball was actually a kind of shield, and inside was something incredible, a creature that could only be described as extraterrestrial, and it was soon to be designated SCP-163. The alien immediately lashed out at the agents, but they were able to subdue it and transport it back to a Foundation containment site for further investigation. SCP-163 is like nothing that has ever been seen on this planet. It stands two meters tall and is one and a half meters wide. Its body is roughly cylindrical, with a circular mouth on its lower body, and something that resembles a head on top. It has eight legs, each with three joints that are arranged radially around the middle of its body. It also has multiple specialized limbs, including two prehensile apparatus on either side of its mouth to assist with feeding two arms just below the head area that are capable of finer movement and the delicate manipulation of objects, two larger arms just above its legs that are used for the manipulation of heavy objects as well as self-defense, and the remains of two appendages also near the mouth that appear to have been amputated at some point prior to its discovery. 30 centimeters from the top of SCP-163's head is a single semi-compound eye which wraps all the way around its head, giving it complete 360-degree vision. The eye is separated into 88 separate units and is sensitive to ultraviolet C light, a short wavelength light that's harmful to most life on Earth. Its skin is transparent when exposed to the wavelengths of light that humans can see, but turns opaque under ultraviolet light. The strange properties of SCP-163 don't stop with what's on the outside. Tests of the creature's green-colored blood have revealed that it processes oxygen and carbon dioxide similar to many creatures on Earth, but its circulatory system is nickel-based, as opposed to the iron or copper-based systems used by most terrestrial organisms. It also has an endoskeleton composed of tissue that's similar to cellulose, the substance that plant cell walls are made of, and its cells use DNA for instructions just like human cells do, with the same ACGT bases, but SCP-163 interprets those instructions differently from the way human cells do. All of these differences mean that SCP-163's home environment must be radically different from Earth's, with different types of proportions of elements present. Certain elements that are perfectly safe for humans are dangerous to SCP-163 and vice versa. Tests have shown that while it's able to survive in our atmosphere unaided, it will begin to show signs of illness after one hour. In order to stay alive, it's vital that SCP-163 continues to possess and maintain the universal life support device that was discovered with it, designated SCP-1631. 
the device is able to convert basic chemical elements into subsistence for 163, as well as projecting the protective metallic shield that it was found encased in. The other technology recovered from alongside SCP-163 has yet to be fully understood, though research is ongoing. The technology is surprisingly low-tech, with much of it consisting of transistors assembled into analog computers, with seemingly varied purposes. The processes these computers appear to be modeling do not match up with any known scientific processes, and it's theorized that they have something to do with 163's life support. It's still not known how or if it communicates complex ideas. When in certain states, it produces a steady sinusoidal wave at approximately 15 hertz that can last anywhere from 15 seconds to 10 minutes, and personnel that have been exposed to the sound have reported experiencing feelings of paranoia and are recommended to remain in well-lit conditions until the feeling subsides. SCP-163's main way of expressing emotion appears to be with the lump of tissue above its compound eye, and depending on how it feels, it will furrow its brow in a number of different ways. It has also been shown to display a positive response to something by rapidly beating its delicate upper arms together, and a negative response by doing the same with its two powerful lower arms. SCP-163 is to be contained in an enclosure with rooms for living, dining, work, and sleep as well as a receiving room with an airlock and seating that's appropriate for both 163 and a human researcher. The air in the enclosure is to be filtered and regularly checked for impurities, and there are two lighting systems, one that produces light within the human visible spectrum and one producing ultraviolet light. Personnel are to wear isolation suits at all times when in the enclosure to protect both themselves and SCP-163 from cross-contamination. Surprisingly, SCP-163, which has been classified as safe, is also free to leave its enclosure, provided it don its own isolation suit first, and is escorted by a researcher at all times. A number of experiments have been performed in an attempt to communicate with SCP-163 as well as determine its level of intelligence. In one test, a number of cards with images printed on them that depicted various human expressions and emotions were shown to 163. It did not appear to recognize any of them, but it did hold the 18th image shown up over the presiding researcher's faceplate. In another, it was given a test to see whether it was capable of selflessness and would offer help if given the chance. A researcher brought two wooden blocks and a box into 163's enclosure. The researcher opened the box and placed one block inside before closing the box. The researcher then tried to place the other block inside the box acting as if they were struggling and couldn't figure out why the block wouldn't go inside the closed box. After watching for 10 seconds, SCP-163 assisted the researcher and opened the box, a result consistent with how human children behave when given the same test. But the most unexpected result of all came when a researcher brought a canvas, brushes, and a selection of ultraviolet-colored paints to 163's enclosure. 163 immediately began painting after being shown how, and soon produced a painting of an alien landscape with never-before-seen plants and animals. SCP-163 stared at the painting it had produced for seven minutes before seeming to become angry, knocking the painting to the floor and retreating to a corner of its room. It furrowed the tissue on its head, indicating distress, and all attempts at communicating with it failed. That is, until the researcher tried to remove the painting supplies at which point SCP-163 beat its heavy arms together to indicate its unhappiness. The next day, the researcher brought more painting supplies, and SCP-163 continues to paint imagery of what is presumably its home alien planet. It's truly amazing and lucky that SCP-163 was discovered. The Foundation is now monitoring all excavations of rock strata that are of similar age to the one 163 was discovered in. Perhaps one day another extraterrestrial will be discovered, offering 163 potentially a way home, or, at the very least, a friend. Two teenagers cautiously approach an old, decrepit house. The house looks like it was built hundreds of years ago, and from the outside, it appears to be in a serious state of disrepair. The walls are cracked and weathered, the roof looks to have holes in it, and one of the decorative columns has completely collapsed. The teenagers have heard rumors about this dilapidated home, though, and they have heard there are riches still to be found inside. One of the teens starts walking up the stairs onto the porch, but his friend seems reluctant to follow. Is he sure that no one lives here? The braver of the teens tells his friend, 
that he's been watching the house for days and hasn't seen anyone come in or out. The only signs of life have been a very faint light visible between the cracks of the house's boarded up windows, and he's not even sure if he actually saw any lights or not. If there is anyone in there, it's just some crazy old person. They can easily scare them off and loot the house at their leisure. His friend still doesn't look sure, but the other teen proceeds to take out a lockpick. He tells his friend to keep a lookout while he works on the door. He doesn't need to keep watch for long, though, since the lock almost immediately opens with a loud click. He opens the door carefully, but it still squeaks loudly. Through the crack, he can't see much of anything inside. It looks very dark. Come on, he tells his friend as he slips inside. His friend looks nervous as he watches his friend disappear into the house. Suddenly, there's a loud crash. Oh no, we've been caught, he thinks as he spins around. But he doesn't see a police officer coming to arrest them or a nosy passerby. Instead, he watches as a cat chases a rat into some trash cans, knocking more of them over. He breathes a sigh of relief as he watches the cat come out of the pile of trash, holding its prey limply by the tail. He turns to follow his friend into the house, but is stopped when the door snaps shut in his face. He tries the doorknob, but it's locked. He taps quietly on the door. No response. He taps a little louder, whispering, Hey, what's going on? But still no response. What is going on? Inside, his friend is also pulling on the doorknob, but it's no use. The door won't budge, and the lock won't turn. He also tries tapping lightly on the door, but there's no signs from outside that anyone has heard him. He's trapped. He looks around the darkened room. Just like the outside, the interior looks like it hasn't been updated in hundreds of years. Dust and cobwebs are everywhere, like no one has set foot inside in decades. And yet, on several small tables and shelves around the room, are lit candles. With no other option, he decides to move deeper into the house. He creeps into the next room, which is in much the same condition as the first, dusty and old, but with several candles placed around that give off just the faintest amount of flickering yellow light. Not only does someone still live here, but they've lit these candles recently. He takes a folding knife out of his pocket and opens it, holding the blade out in front of him. Just then, he hears something, a noise like footsteps, and it sounds like it's coming from upstairs in the room right above him. They might be coming down to look for him. He needs a place to hide. He spots a sofa near the corner and tries to get down behind it as much as possible. As he grips the edge of the sofa with one hand, he suddenly drops his knife to the floor and uses his now free hand to stifle a scream. He looks at the hand that was just gripping the sofa and sees a long sewing needle plunge deep into his hand. Was this stuck into the couch? He pulls the needle out of his hand. It nearly went all the way through and holds the bloody wound up to his mouth, trying to stop the flow of blood as he waits and listens. The sound of footsteps finally stop. Whoever is walking around, it doesn't sound like they're coming down the stairs to find him. He has to get out of this house, though. There must be another way out. He picks up his knife and quietly moves to the next room. Once again, it's in the same condition as the last. But wait, what's that in the corner? Is that a person lying there? Outside the house, his friend is looking through the same trash that he saw the cat hunting in. Aha! Just what he was looking for, an old wire hanger. He runs back to the old house, untwists it, and inserts the thin wire into the lock. Inside, the trespassing teen gets closer and closer to the thing in the corner. It's so dim, though, with the only light coming from the candles that he still can't make out what it is. But he feels strangely compelled to find out. He picks up one of the candles off of a nearby table. Outside, he still can't get the lock open, but he's got to keep trying. He can't leave his friend trapped inside. He's standing right over the thing in the corner now. He kneels down and brings the candle close to see what it is, and screams. His friend throws down the hanger in frustration before sitting down on the porch. He can't figure out why his friend was able to open the lock so easily and now it won't move. Did something in the mechanism break? He doesn't know what he's going to do though. Should he call for help? The police will arrest them both if he does. How long should he wait though? It feels like his friend has been stuck for a long time and he hasn't heard anything from inside. What could possibly be happening in there? Should he just leave and hope that his friend is able to escape on his own? Just as he is wondering what to do, he hears a click behind him. He turns around and tries the door handle, but it's still locked. He looks down and sees the wire hanger. Maybe he'll give it one more try. He sticks the hanger into the lock and hears the lock pop open almost instantly. He tries the door handle, and this time, the door swings open. 
He stands there looking through the cracked door into the dark house. He's terrified at the thought of going inside, but he can't leave his friend in there. If he's in trouble, then he has to save him. Gathering up all of his courage, he enters the house and sees the same thing his friend did, a dusty old room. He takes a step into the candlelit room and freezes. There's something in the middle of the room. It's a chair that's turned away from him, but he can see that someone is sitting in it. But wait, is that his friend? Hey, he calls in a loud whisper, but his friend doesn't respond. Come on, let's get out of here. Still no response. He starts walking toward his friend, but stops when he hears what sounds like footsteps coming from the room above him. He's got to get his friend and get out of this house. He checks over his shoulder to make sure the door is still open before starting to quietly move towards his friend again. He's close enough that he can reach out and shake his shoulder, but his friend doesn't react. He walks around to the front of the chair and sees his friend, except it's no longer his friend. Staring back at him are two empty eye sockets. His mouth has been pulled back by stitches of thread into a horrifying permanent grin. But worst of all is what he hears. It's the sound of the front door slamming shut. Привет! Today's file is a special one and comes from the Russian branch of the SCP Foundation. It's SCP-1098-RU, also known as the Theater of Living Puppets. SCP-1098-RU is a two-story house located in a small Russian city which appears to have been constructed in the Baroque style, which was popular in the 17th and 18th centuries, and is characterized by its exuberant details. The house is likely several hundred years old and is in an advanced state of disrepair. The local government administration has marked the house for demolition multiple times, but for reasons that remain unknown, these plans are always scrapped or indefinitely delayed. All of the doors that lead into SCP-1098-RU are locked and the windows are all boarded up. Anyone who attempts to damage the house, even just by removing the boards from the windows, will experience an odd anomalous effect that compels them to instead protect the structure and cause it no harm. This effect only wears off when the subject moves at least 50 meters away from the house. The only way to enter SCP-1098-RU is through the front door, which even though it is locked, is easily able to be picked open which causes no harm to the house and prevents the anomalous effect from overcoming the subject trying to gain entrance. Once someone has entered the house, they will find that the door closes behind them and locks itself. The lock cannot then be picked open again for one hour. The interior of the house matches the exterior stylistically, also appearing to have been designed in the Baroque style and in a poor condition. The house is quite dark since there are no electric lights present and all of the windows are boarded up, blocking any outside light. The only illumination comes from the lit candles that are placed around the house, which appear to be constantly replaced and lit again when they burn out. The sound of slow footsteps can be heard inside the house, but the room they are coming from seems to change. The entity producing the sounds has been classified as SCP-1098-RU-1, and it is thought that it is also responsible for the placing and relighting of candles around the house, as well as several other anomalous effects. The Russian branch of the SCP Foundation first became aware of potential anomalous activity related to SCP-1098-RU after the disappearance of multiple teenagers was linked to the location. In interviews, many of their friends and family reported that their last known locations were near the site of the old Baroque-style home, and several had expressed a desire to investigate the house before they disappeared. Local police investigated the house, which only led to them disappearing as well. After learning of the strange activity connected to the house, the Foundation took over the investigation, planting a cover story that totalitarian sects were responsible for the disappearances, while Class A amnestics were administered to all relatives of the missing teens. The Foundation immediately began investigating the house, but carefully, since they had already seen how easily people could go missing inside. In the first excursion into the house, a remotely controlled robot fitted with a camera was sent inside. Just like when a person enters, the door closed and locked behind the robot, but its camera feed continued to broadcast images to the researchers outside. As the robot explored the rundown house's rooms, it found something much more disturbing than just lit candles. In several of the rooms, corpses were discovered, which were later identified as being some of the missing teenagers. All of the bodies found had their eyeballs removed and thick threads had been sewn into their arms and legs, as if they had been turned into giant living puppets. 
Some of them also had stitches in their chest and face areas. The face stitches appear to have been made to force the face to have a certain expression, while the chest stitches may indicate that organs had been removed. No signs of decomposition were present though, despite some of the bodies likely being many months old. Several objects were also found next to the bodies, including surgical knives, needles, thread, and at least one artificial eye. Exactly one hour after the robot entered the house, the camera ceased broadcasting images and all contact was lost. For the second excursion into the house, the Foundation decided that a human being would be more effective at gathering information than a robot. A Class D personnel was given a flashlight, a camera, and a radio, and sent on a mission to attempt to remove objects from the house and to locate the robot from the first research mission. The D-Class entered the house, and researchers noted that from what they could see on the video feed, that the layout of the house hadn't changed. Candles were still present around the room, though it was clear that they had been replaced by fresh ones. As the D-Class explored the first floor of the house, he reported that he could hear footsteps coming from different parts of the house, and on one occasion, that they sounded like they were coming from a room he had just left. But when he returned to that room, no one was present. He wasn't able to locate the missing robot, but did find the same corpses that the robot had. He was ordered by the researchers to pick up one of the surgical knives and try bringing it out of the house, but the moment he picked it up, all contact was lost. A third mission into the house was then tried, this time with another remotely controlled robot, though this one was more advanced and equipped with a thermal imager and audio recording equipment. This robot was also better suited for exploration and was capable of climbing stairs so that the Foundation could finally find out what was on the second floor of this strange house. The robot entered the home and ascended to the second floor. As it explored the rooms, it found one particularly strange one that appeared to be operating as a kind of sewing workshop, with huge amounts of thread, needles, and other sewing supplies spread across multiple tables. Dark red stains covered many of the tables, but no bodies were discovered in the sewing room. The robot continued to explore the second floor though, and soon discovered many more corpses, accounting for nearly all of the missing teenagers, the police that had vanished, as well as the missing D-Class personnel. All of them had been dressed in 18th century style clothing, and their eyes had been removed and replaced with artificial ones, giving them a perpetual glassy-eyed stare. Long thick threads had been sewn into their arms and legs as well. The sound recording equipment on the robot captured the same sounds of footsteps that the D-Class had reported, but the thermal imager didn't locate any signs of life. The researchers decided to call an end to the experiment and began guiding the robot back out of the house. But just as it reached the front door, the connection was lost, and the robot has never been located. One final expedition into the home was approved, this time using another D-Class personnel, whose mission was to explore the entire house, including the second floor, before attempting to leave the home. The D-Class entered the home as normal, but immediately reported feeling a strange feeling that the other D-Class hadn't mentioned. He told the researchers listening that he was experiencing an intense headache and pressure in his ears, and that he could hear what sounded like someone crying in another room. None of the equipment picked up the crying sounds, and the D-Class was ordered to investigate further. He approached the room that he claimed the sound was coming from, but still nothing was detected on the audio recording equipment. He was ordered to enter the room, and though he seemed scared and reluctant, eventually he did so. Once inside, he reported seeing a young girl wearing an 18th century style dress. The girl was dancing, but crying as she did so. Just like on the corpses that had previously been found inside the house, threads were connected to her arms and legs, but these ones were pulled tight and stretched up towards the ceiling. The D-Class followed their path up, but they disappeared into the darkness, reporting that it looked like there was no ceiling at all, just an inky black void where something was manipulating the strings attached to the girl, forcing her to dance. None of these visuals reported by the Class D could be seen on the video feeds the researchers were watching. As far as they could see, he was staring into an empty room. The D-Class was ordered to continue watching this strange recital though, and after five minutes, all of the communication devices ceased working. The video feed was lost too, but the audio continued to record for a few more seconds, during which time, a sharp clap noise was heard. The D-Class began screaming as a deep male voice spoke a phrase in Latin, et perficiendi sit pretium. The performance must be paid for. No further signs of the D-Class were ever found. SCP-1098-RU has since been fenced off to prevent the general public from being able to enter it. 
A patrol team of four security guards is always on site, and anyone who attempts to gain entry to the house is to be detained, interrogated, and administered Class B amnestics. Additional research into SCP-1098-RU is ongoing, but requires approval from at least two members of the O5 Council, and to date, no further expeditions inside this anomaly, which has been given the object Class Euclid, have been authorized. It is still unknown who or what exactly the entity inside of SCP-1098-RU is, but it has been designated as SCP-1098-RU-1, and some in the Foundation have taken to calling it by a nickname, the Master of Puppets. A prisoner in a striped uniform is led down the central corridor of a penitentiary by a pair of guards. Wherever he's being taken, the prisoner is not going peacefully. The other inmates stand at their cell doors watching as he is dragged past them. The prisoner is begging for the guards to show him mercy, pleading for them not to make him go in there, to subject him to anything, anything in the world, but that. The guards pay no attention to his cries as they force him along. They reach the end of the corridor and stop in front of the last cell, number 667. The prisoner looks into the dark, empty cell and screams struggling against his captors one last time before they overpower him and shove him inside, slamming the door shut behind him. The prisoner looks around the small, dim cell. All that's inside is a bed with a thin mattress and a filthy toilet. He looks extremely scared, his eyes searching around the cell as if a monster is going to leap out from a dark corner and grab him. The prisoner hears a cracking sound and jumps in fright, spinning around to see a different kind of monster. Standing between the two guards who led him here, is a third prison guard. He's enormous, and the prisoner watches as he cracks the knuckles of his massive hands. The giant guard reaches for something hanging next to the cell door. It's a uh, clipboard. He looks at the prisoner's uniform and notes his name before writing it down. The large guard asks over his shoulder, So, what are we thinking? One day? Two? For this one? One of the other guards answers. He deserves a lot more than that for what he did. Why, what'd he do? asks the big one. He attacked one of the nurses. She's in pretty bad shape. One of the nurses. The veins in the larger guard's head start to bulge out as his grip on the pencil tightens. Who was it? It was… it was Gloria, the guard answers. The pencil snaps in the giant guard's hand. One of the guards quickly picks it up and hands it back to him. Through gritted teeth, he answers, I see. As the giant guard stares at him with angry, violent eyes, the prisoner starts to slink back into the dark cell terrified of what's going to happen to him. You like to attack nurses, do you? Well, we're gonna give you plenty of time to think about that. I'll see you in a year. The two other guards look at each other, clearly thinking that this is extreme even for a crime like this. Are you sure that's a good idea? One of them asks, but it's already too late. The guard has penciled in the date for exactly one year later. No, please, no! The prisoner screams, rushing towards the bars and reaching out as if it will somehow help him, but it doesn't. There's a faint rustling of wind that seems to carry the sound of whispers, and then the prisoner vanishes. He's simply gone, blinked out of existence. The guard hangs the clipboard back on the wall before turning and quickly walking away. He needs to get to the infirmary. The two guards can do nothing but shrug at each other and follow after him. Poor guy, one of them whispers as they walk away from the empty cell. One year to the day later, the huge guard walks down the same prison corridor. It's late at night, and as he walks along, he lets his baton hit against the bars of the cells, making a loud clatter. Wake up, everyone, wake up. It's a homecoming day. Sleepy prisoners get up out of their beds and stand at the front of their cells, trying their best to look through the bars to see the cell at the end of the block. See what happens when you mess with staff? Come on, get up, get up, today's the day. It's a homecoming. The guard gets to the end of the corridor and stops in front of the empty cell with the clipboard hanging on the wall next to it. The door is open, and there's nothing inside the dark cell except for the same dirty toilet and bed. The guard takes out his pocket watch and checks the time. Everyone, the guard and the prisoners alike, are all focused on the empty cell. The guard checks his watch again. The minute hand ticks over to midnight, and the moment it does, the cell door slides shut and locks with a loud click. The prison is completely silent, each inmate waiting with bated breath to see what happens next. The guard takes out a large, heavy ring of keys and inserts one into the cell door before stepping inside. He looks around, and still it appears that nothing inside is different. But then he spots what he's looking for. 
There in the corner, near the toilet, is a huddled figure in a striped prison uniform. Well, 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 there you are. The guard starts to walk towards this person who has somehow appeared in the cell, but the huddled figure doesn't move or react in any way. The guard reaches down and puts a hand on the man to flip him over. How'd you enjoy your stay? Solitary confinement is one of the most brutal forms of punishment that is still in use across much of the world today. The psychological and physical distress that comes from days, weeks, months, even sometimes years spent alone can be devastating. But as horrible as this practice is, there exists a form of retribution that is even more terrifying. One that even the most hardened of criminals fear and would do anything to avoid. This is SCP-2701, also known as True Solitary. SCP-2701 is a seemingly standard-looking prison cell located in a now-condemned Pennsylvania State Penitentiary. The prison, which was built in the early mid-1800s, was showing its age long before it was finally shut down, and the cell contains only an old toilet and bed, with a clipboard hanging to the left of the cell with various forms marked as intake. The cell's construction materials appear normal, and the contents themselves are non-anomalous. It is only when someone is placed inside of SCP-2701 and the clipboard next to the cell is used that its frightening effects become evident. When a human being is locked within the cell, their name is written on the intake form and a date is filled in under the Release Date section, SCP-2701's anomalous activation event is put in motion. Thirteen seconds after these conditions have been met, the person inside will disappear, completely vanishing from view as if they simply no longer exist. Any attempts to better understand the process by which they dematerialize have been unsuccessful, as all recording equipment looking into or placed inside the cell will show only static or blank images during the 13 seconds before the subject disappears. Researchers observing the effect in person, though, have reported the sounds of wind and unidentified whispering voices, but it is still unknown what may be producing these. At 12 o'clock AM on the dot on the release date, the cell's door will somehow close and lock itself if it is not already shut. At this exact moment, the person who vanished will reappear within the locked cell. Unfortunately for the person who was locked inside, while they may have returned to our reality, it is unlikely that they will ever be the same. Experiments into SCP-2701 have revealed that those who are placed inside and vanish will experience a state of complete sensory deprivation while remaining fully conscious the entire time. They experience no sounds, smells, or sense of touching anything. They do not even see darkness, since that would imply sight. Instead, they truly experience no senses at all. This effect can be disastrous for the human psyche, with subjects reporting that they have developed intense fears of both shadows and light, claustrophobia, agoraphobia, and a fear of going to sleep following their time within SCP-2701. At the same time, they will have experienced no physical changes at all, including aging, no matter how much time has passed. But the worst part of SCP-2701 is that those who are locked inside do not experience time at the same rate as you or I. No tests have revealed that once someone disappears from within the cell, they will feel as if time has been significantly stretched out, with the dilation effect causing them to perceive time at a rate that has been estimated to be between 3 and 400 times longer than normal. That means that someone placed inside for two hours will experience time as if they have been locked away for 25 to 33 days, while someone placed inside for a whole year will feel as though they have been floating in a void of nothingness for several centuries. Foundation researchers have theorized that the absence of any outside stimulation for that long of a period causes the mind to break down rational thought structures in an effort to mitigate stress and that a complete psychological breakdown soon follows. In order to better understand the effects of SCP-2701, the SCP Foundation embarked on a number of tests using Class D personnel. In one experiment, which was performed on a D-Class known as D-77391, the event started at 11.45 pm and the release date was set for the coming midnight. This led to the D-Class being inside the cell for 15 minutes, though they experienced their time within as having lasted 75 to 100 hours. When D-77391 was interviewed six hours after reappearing, they described their time inside as being a true hell. Experiencing nothing but emptiness, they couldn't do anything. They couldn't sleep. They couldn't even scream. They were left alone with only their thoughts and memories. The only thing that kept them from completely losing their mind was something one of the researchers told them before they entered the cell. 
the researcher told them that no matter what they felt, that they had to hold on to the idea that they were going to come back. They needed to remember they wouldn't be in there forever. While these words of encouragement did seem to stave off the worst of the mental effects D-77391 could have suffered, they also impacted the results of the experiment, and the offending researcher was later reassigned to a different project, following a six-month suspension. The SCP Foundation first became aware of SCP-2701 following reports of certain abnormalities at a Pennsylvania state penitentiary. There were numerous complaints by lawyers that they were not being allowed to meet with their clients and that they were being denied access to the site by the prison's warden. When police were finally dispatched to the site to investigate, it was discovered that the entire prison, which previously housed 137 inmates and employed a number of staff, had only one inhabitant. The warden. He described the activation procedure for cell 667 and explained that he had placed every single prisoner inside, one by one, and made them disappear. He had been keeping the funds that were supposed to be used for the care of the inmates, as well as to bribe officials and former staff in order to keep the warden's scheme secret and prevent any official inquiries. The warden surrendered to the police without incident, and an undercover Foundation agent within the Philadelphia police soon alerted SCP agents to the cell's anomalous effects. When a Foundation team arrived on site, they found the cell exactly as described, along with the intake forms. The prison warden had been telling the truth. Over a hundred forms were filled out with inmates' names, with release dates ranging from 50 to over 1300 years in the future. The ease with which SCP-2701 is able to be contained has led to it receiving the safe classification. The former prison where SCP-2701 is located is monitored at all times by video and audio surveillance, and a security guard equipped with full body restraints is present at all times to both detain any subjects who appear within the cell, as well as prevent any new ones from being placed inside, that aren't a part of an official SCP Foundation experiment. A young man and his girlfriend enter the apartment they share. She tosses her keys on the entryway table as the man checks the time on his phone. He reminds the young woman that they will need to leave soon if they don't want to miss the movie they have purchased tickets for. The woman agrees, but she wants to take a quick shower before they leave. As she goes to freshen up, the man sits down at his computer to get in a quick round or two of his favorite online squad-based first-person shooter. He puts on his headset and jumps into a game. Before he knows it, he's just finished his third round. He checks the time on his phone again and realizes that they were running late. He takes off his headphones and is confused when he hears what sounds like the shower still running. He gets up and goes to the bathroom door and listens. The shower is definitely still on. The man knocks on the door and asks if everything is alright. He waits a moment, but there's no response. He knocks again, and still, nothing. She doesn't usually take showers this long, and he immediately worries that she might have passed out or… well, he doesn't even want to think about it. I'm coming in, okay? he announces as he opens the door to check on her. The man immediately notices how steamy the room is. The hot water must have been running for a while, and he's worried she really did pass out from the heat. What's going on, are you okay? He asks, and when there's no response again, he pulls open the shower curtain to find… nothing. Just an empty tub. There's no sign of his girlfriend anywhere. The man is beyond confused. He turns off the water and goes to the bedroom, but she isn't in there either. He runs to the front door, but it's still locked, and her keys are sitting on the table. He unlocks the door and sticks his head out into the hallway anyway, but nothing is out there. What is going on? He checks the bedroom again, then the bathroom, but she hasn't suddenly reappeared in either. He's in complete shock, unsure of what could be happening. He sits down on the toilet and puts his head in his hands. His head is spinning as it feels like the world is suddenly falling down all around him. The police are immediately suspicious of the man's story. His girlfriend simply vanished while taking a shower? Do you expect us to believe that? The detective asks. The man has no answer, though. It's as if she simply blinked out of existence. He's convinced she must still be in the building somewhere, that she somehow slipped out without him noticing. But none of the security footage from inside the building shows anything abnormal. There's footage from the cameras in the lobby of them entering the building, but nothing after that of her leaving. Just as in every missing person case like this, the boyfriend is the number one suspect, but without any evidence, they can't hold him any longer. After many long hours of interviews, they finally allow him to leave, but not back to the apartment, since it's an active crime scene. The man has no family to speak of, and his few friends seem to have the same suspicions as the police and want nothing to do with him. His girlfriend was the only person he truly had in the world, and now she's gone. He's put up in a shabby motel and days pass, then weeks, then months. 
but no evidence of the missing woman ever turns up. The man replays the memory of that day over and over in his head, searching for some kind of answer. But try as he might, he can't remember anything helpful, no clue as to what could have happened. The case is completely cold, and has been from the very start. The police eventually have to move on to newer, more solvable cases, and they finally allow the man to return home. He's overwhelmed with emotion the first time he enters the apartment. The place is a mess. It looks like the police turned it inside out looking for clues. Not knowing what else to do, he starts the long process of cleaning up the apartment. After hours of putting things away, he eventually gathers the strength to go to the one room he's been avoiding, the bathroom. He opens the door to the last place he's certain his girlfriend was. He enters to find that it looks like the rest of the apartment, as if someone has looked at every single object. But just like him, the police never found any trace of where she went. After straightening up this last room, he decides that he should take a shower and go to bed. It fills him with dread to think about standing in the last place he knows where she was. But he's had months to grieve the loss of his girlfriend, and he's decided that he needs to move on, whatever that means when someone goes missing without a trace. He turns on the shower and lets the water heat up before stepping in. Once he's in, every thought he has is about her. He wonders if she ever actually got in the shower at all, or somehow used it as a diversion to slip out unseen. He just can't figure out how. The day's events race through his mind, just as they have a thousand times before, but his thoughts are interrupted when he notices that the water has started to pool around his feet. He looks down and sees that the drain cover looks normal. Maybe there's a clog, though. Do showers clog when they're not used? He has no idea. He bends down to get a closer look. The long, black creature emerges from the drain in the blink of an eye and latches onto his mouth, muffling him before he even has a chance to scream. He struggles and pulls down the curtain on top of him as he falls back onto the shower floor. But it's already too late, and in a matter of minutes, he too will be gone without a trace. Is there anything more comforting after a hard day than a nice, long, hot shower? The answer to that is no, there is nothing better. But that relaxing shower might just be the last you ever take when unbeknownst to you, your pipes are home to an instance of SCP-153, also known as drain worms. SCP-153 refers to a species that resembles the common nematode, or roundworm, consisting of a long, thin body with a large mouth on one end. While some roundworms can grow to as large as a meter long, which is in itself a disturbing thought, SCP-153 instances can be much, much larger and it is estimated that they can reach up to nearly 10 meters in length, though it is hypothesized that some instances in the wild may grow even longer. These worm-like creatures will feed off of any available organic material. However, their favorite form of sustenance is fresh animal tissue, and they appear to have an especially strong predilection towards human flesh. In order to satiate their desire to feed on their preferred prey, SCP-153 has developed a rather unique predatory style that perfectly suits its elongated body structure. While it is unknown just where they originate, they are most often found in the pipes of sewer and drainage systems. 153 instances will swim up those pipes, seeking out ones that lead to people's homes, and especially those that connect to showers and bathtubs. Once they reach the end of the pipe, SCP-153 will latch onto the drain cover and begin secreting an acidic substance. The acid quickly dissolves the drain cover, and SCP-153 will position its own mouth in its place, which it then is able to camouflage as the missing drain cover almost perfectly. Once SCP-153 has taken this position, it is virtually impossible to distinguish it from the original or discern that anything has changed. SCP-153 will then lie in wait until it detects that someone has entered the shower or bathtub. Once the unsuspecting person has begun to bathe, it will very quickly emerge from the drain latching onto the victim's face, most likely in order to prevent them from calling for help. It then begins to rapidly secrete more of the same acid that it used to dissolve the drain cover. With how effectively it was able to dissolve metal, it's no surprise that SCP-153 is able to quickly produce the same effect on its victim. Their skin, muscle, and bone will all be almost immediately liquefied, allowing SCP-153 to feed on the slurry, and the drain worms feed extremely quickly as well. After just several minutes, basically nothing will remain of the person who stepped into the shower, and 153 will retreat back into the drain, leaving no signs that it was ever there, save for the missing drain cover. The SCP Foundation became aware of this anomaly following multiple mysterious missing person cases that all had one key element in common, 
Each was reported as having disappeared after entering a bathroom to either shower or take a bath. The Foundation soon discovered that large populations of SCP-153 instances were living in the sewers beneath several major American cities and immediately began enacting containment procedures. The Foundation collected as many specimens as they could and brought them to Bioresearch Area 12, where they keep them contained in 10 by 10 by 5 meter tanks that are kept partially filled with sewage and other organic material for them to feed on. Of course, it is of the utmost importance that these containers are never connected to any other plumbing systems, either internal or external. With several specimens contained, the Foundation began researching the creatures in order to hopefully better understand them and how they were able to develop such complex hunting techniques. Research was also approved to find out whether they could be used as a sort of waste disposal system in certain extreme circumstances, such as with SCP-2717, a mass of living animal tissue that has grown to line nearly four kilometers of sewer pipes beneath Amsterdam. A small number of SCP-153 instances were approved for release into the wild in order to test whether they could stall the spread of 2717. However, this experiment was halted following some disturbing new reports. More missing person reports came to the Foundation's attention that bore the hallmarks of an SCP-153 attack. But these new reports were not limited to people who vanished after bathing. It now appears that SCP-153 has further adapted and has begun to emerge not just from showers and bathtub drains, but now also from sinks and, yes, even toilets. The Foundation is unaware of just how many instances of SCP-153 continue to exist in the wild, but there's no doubt that many continue to live and hunt undetected in sewers around the world. This anomaly, which has been classified as Euclid, is taken very seriously by the Foundation, and any reports of people who go missing from bathrooms are immediately investigated for signs of SCP-153. Field agents are to be equipped with infrared and ultraviolet sensors which can bypass SCP-153's camouflage, and if specimens are able to be captured alive, then they are to be brought to Area 12 for further research. But don't bother worrying too much the next time you step into the tub. If you've been targeted by SCP-153, there's not much you'll be able to do anyway and your worries will soon be going down the drain, along with whatever remains of you. A doctor frantically writes in his journal, It's almost impossible to believe everything that's transpired has taken place in such a short amount of time. It all began three days ago. It was just another day down in the mines. A worker was drilling into a seam of coal when suddenly there was an issue with the rig. From what I've gathered, it sounds like the drill bit exploded due to some kind of mechanical defect, sending shards of metal flying throughout the tunnel. The worker was lucky that none of the large pieces struck him, as they surely would have been fatal. He had, though, still been grazed by a piece of shrapnel from the ruined drill bit, and it had left a deep cut across his upper arm. Other miners who were working nearby heard the commotion and quickly came to his aid. They applied a tourniquet to stem the flow of blood and helped him to the mineshaft elevator for the long ride to the surface. Once they reached the safety of daylight, they brought the injured man to the on-site medical clinic where I was on duty at the time. I cleaned the wound since there was a substantial amount of coal dust that had gotten inside before suturing and bandaging it. The miner was sent to his bunkhouse to recover, and I thought that would be the end of it. Of course, it was only the beginning. Roughly 24 hours later, the same miner presented himself to me once again. I asked about his injury and he explained that while his arm was fine, he now felt like he might be coming down with an illness. His symptoms included a runny nose, a cough, and body aches, so my assumption was that he'd simply had some bad luck and caught a cold that just so happened to coincide with being injured on the job. I sent him to his bunk once again, telling him that he wouldn't be able to work and should instead use the day to rest and recover. The next day, I was once again in the clinic when my phone rang. It wasn't the sick miner, but instead his supervisor. The miner hadn't shown up for his shift that morning, and he asked for me to go check on him since he knew he hadn't been feeling well. I agreed that it was strange that neither of us had heard anything else from the miner and went to see him straight away. I entered the bunkhouse where many of the workers stay while on site at this remote mine. It was empty, except for the injured miner who was still in his bed. As I approached, I could immediately tell something was very wrong. The man was curled up in the fetal position, and was sweating profusely while also shivering. A quick touch of his forehead revealed that the man had a high fever, too. He was practically incoherent, seemingly delirious from his high temperature. 
The miner was moved to the empty bed inside the clinic so I could better observe and tend to him, but very carefully since I assumed now that he was actually suffering from influenza and didn't want to risk an outbreak at the mine. I was getting ready to administer fluids to the miner, who was still mumbling incomprehensibly, when I noticed something on his face. It appeared that he was crying, but the tears that ran down his cheeks weren't made of water. They were blood. I hadn't seen anything like it before. There was no reason why influenza should be causing this man to cry tears of blood. I could see the veins in his forehead starting to pulse, as if his blood pressure had suddenly skyrocketed. And just as I was leaning in to get a closer look, something horrible happened. The miner suddenly opened his mouth and expelled an enormous stream of blood. The blast of blood struck me in the face and knocked me backwards in fright as the man continued expelling more and more blood from his mouth, which soon covered the walls of the clinic. With seemingly all the blood having been discharged from his body, the man then went limp. I attempted to resuscitate him, but strangely, there was no need. The man was comatose, but he was alive. There I was, standing in the middle of the clinic over the man, both he, myself, as well as the room completely covered in blood. It was one of the worst things I'd ever experienced as a doctor, and yet, somehow, it was about to get even worse. I was still in shock from what had just happened when I heard the door to the clinic open behind me. I turned around to see a group of half a dozen more miners from the site, each one coughing, sweating, and shivering. One held a cloth to his ear that was stained red, while another attempted to stop his nose from bleeding. Whatever had infected the first patient wasn't a one-off medical event. This had the makings of an epidemic. I knew that I was in way over my head. I was just a general practitioner, not an infectious disease specialist, and I called the Center for Disease Control to get their guidance. I was told to quarantine the sick man as best I could, and that a rapid response team would be sent who were better equipped to deal with potential outbreaks. While I waited for the CDC to arrive, I began moving the afflicted men to a bunkhouse that had been designated for quarantining. Several more also began expelling huge amounts of blood, though unlike the first patient, none of the others survived the traumatic event. As I was putting the final infected man into a bed, I noticed something, though. There was a huge amount of heat radiating off of his lower body, and when I pulled down the blankets, I discovered something that even with all of the strange happenings, I still couldn't believe. There were huge lumps growing on his legs, each of which looked to be filled with some kind of fluid or gas, and they were extremely hot to the touch, as if the chemicals inside the lumps were creating a source of heat. As I was investigating the bizarre growths, I suddenly looked up to see that the man was no longer in a state of delirium. Instead, a crazed look had come over his eyes, and he suddenly leapt out of bed, flailing and clawing at me as if he wanted to kill me. I don't know how, but... I was able to fight off the man and run out of the bunkhouse. He gave chase, though, and with no other option, I ran into a nearby storage shed. The man was beating and scratching at the door, but I was able to barricade it by dragging a heavy shelf in front of it. After several minutes of trying to break inside, he finally gave up and left. And here I remain. I'm too afraid to go back out. It seems that if the disease won't kill me, then whatever it is turning people into will. All I can do is wait for the CDC team to get here and hopefully know how to deal with whatever the situation has become. The doctor closes his small notebook and notices a drop of something fall onto the cover. He reaches up and wipes his hand across his mouth. It comes back, covered in blood. The doctor didn't know what the disease was that had so rapidly spread through the workers at the mine, nor did the CDC response team when they arrived. No, it wasn't until the SCP Foundation caught word of the mysterious outbreak that someone would finally determine what was happening with what would soon be called SCP-016, which is also known as the Sentient Microorganism. SCP-016 is a blood-borne pathogen that was first discovered after a worker at a remote mine was injured while drilling into a coal seam deep beneath the earth. It is theorized that coal dust entered the wound, dust which perhaps carried dormant spores of what would become SCP-016. Over the next several days, all of the remaining employees at the mine were infected, as was the CDC crisis team that was sent to the mine to investigate the outbreak of what was potentially an undiscovered pathogen. Following the CDC's inability to deal with the disease, the SCP Foundation took over the site and quickly terminated all affected personnel in order to prevent further spread. The first infected person, Patient Zero, 
was taken into Foundation custody for further investigation, and the mine shaft itself was collapsed by an explosive device in order to seal it off. After studying Patient Zero, the Foundation learned a great deal about just what they were dealing with. What they found was that SCP-016 has an incubation period that can vary wildly from just 24 hours to as long as two years, with the length appearing to be dependent on the number of other potential human hosts in the immediate area. Once symptoms begin to present in an individual, they will at first look to be quite similar to the common cold. They can include coughing, a runny nose, itchy eyes, and body aches. Roughly 48 hours after the first symptoms, the infected person will experience a form of hemorrhagic fever similar to the Ebola virus, which causes a small amount of bleeding in the lungs. This leads to the infected blood becoming aspirated, most likely in order to better spread through the air. The third stage of the disease leads to the host crashing and bleeding out as they start to bleed profusely from multiple body orifices, including the nose, tear ducts, mouth, and even through the pores of their skin. Their blood pressure will also skyrocket during this final stage, and in some cases, have vomited blood as far as 5 meters. Oddly enough, although most die from the traumatic event, this almost complete exsanguination will not always result in death. Sometimes, following the removal of almost all blood from the body, the patient will somehow survive, and the pathogen inside their body will return to its dormant phase once again, before eventually repeating the process. But SCP-016 is more than just a rapid and often deadly bloodborne disease, as you will soon see. As SCP researchers studied the disease, what they discovered was that it had a very strange property that sets it apart from other hemorrhagic fevers like Ebola and the Marburg virus. What they found was that when someone infected with SCP-016 is placed into a high-stress situation, such as one where their life is being threatened, SCP-016 will transition from rapidly reproducing inside of its host's body to instead begin rewriting their host's actual DNA. This genetic manipulation, combined with the stimulation of rapid cell division, leads to the host undergoing major physiological changes and in extremely small amounts of time. In just 24 hours, the host can begin showing physical changes to their body, and a complete bodily reconstruction can occur in less than two weeks. Most of the hosts who begin to undergo physical changes will not survive the process, due to how heavily the transformation stresses the body, but those that do will be changed in more than just physical ways. They'll exhibit hyper-aggressive behaviors not dissimilar to those infected by rabies. And it's theorized that the pathogen may cause this behavior in order to better spread the virus. When the Foundation realized that SCP-016 was capable of these transformative effects, they immediately undertook a number of experiments on D-Class personnel in order to better understand their full extent. In the first test, a D-Class was infected with SCP-016, and as soon as they began showing symptoms, their cell was slowly flooded with water in order to stimulate the life-threatening situation needed to trigger the transformation process. Over the next 24 hours, researchers watched as the subject appeared to develop gills which would allow it to survive in the now water-filled cell. The transformations didn't stop there, though, and over the next two weeks, the subject also had their limbs change into fins, their eyesight deteriorated, and their sense of hearing increased as they developed an echolocation ability very similar to the one employed by whales and dolphins. The experiment was concluded by removing all of the water from the cell leading to the death of the subject from asphyxiation as they could no longer breathe in the open air. A similar experiment was performed on another D-Class, but this time, instead of taking on aquatic animal properties, the D-Class experienced rapid muscle growth and their knuckles grew bone-like protrusions. It attempted to use both of these to break through the door of their flooding cell, but they were unable to breach the reinforced steel and soon died from drowning. The Foundation now knew that the virus could react in different ways to the same situation. The same experiment was run a third time, but in this instance, the infected D-Class exhibited an entirely different means of trying to escape. The subject had a massive growth appear on its chest, which seemed to be fed from two different tubes of flesh, also emanating from the subject's body. Fearing what it planned to do, the Foundation ended the experiment early and terminated the subject. An autopsy revealed that the growth was actually a hollow chamber that was being fed by the tubes with oxygen and acetylene gas, which when combined in sufficient amounts would cause a massive combustion event. In other words, SCP-016 was turning the subject into a living bomb. Moving on from flooded cell tests, 
The researchers next left the D-Class inside of a room with no stressing elements and instead told them to focus on growing a pair of wings. Without any reason to begin the transformation process, SCP-016 went through its normal stages and the subject died from blood loss without any other changes occurring. In the final test, a D-Class was placed inside of an acrylic box that was suspended over a mine shaft, with a timer attached indicating the time when the bottom of the box would open and drop the D-Class into the thousand-foot deep shaft. This D-Class was also told to focus on growing wings that would allow them to survive the plunge. The subject began to transform over the next 24 hours, but rather than grow wings, they instead developed a tentacle-like appendage on their arm that was capable of producing silk similar to a spider's spinneret. They used the silk-producing organ to secure themselves to the box, showing that subjects did not appear to be able to control the way in which SCP-016 would alter their bodies. This experiment concluded when the timer reached zero and the bomb attached to it detonated, as had been the plan all along. Following this last test, SCP-016 samples were placed into containment and access to the sample for experimental purposes is only allowed with prior authorization from Level 4 or O5 personnel, with full documentation of the proposed experiment required beforehand. Failure to follow any of these procedures will lead to the offending personnel being reassigned to D-Class duty or terminated. SCP-016 has been classified as Keter, and the only existing sample is kept in a petri dish which is under extreme lockdown inside of a 5 by 5 by 5 meter room, where the temperature is kept below 0 degrees Celsius at all times. Should an outbreak of SCP-016 occur, all infected personnel are to be immediately terminated on site, and if the infection cannot be contained within 48 hours, then the on-site nuclear device is to be detonated, prior to any additional personnel being evacuated. While the containment procedures may sound callous, unfortunately when it comes to anomalous pathogens as dangerous as SCP-016, no chances can be taken. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-150, the body-stealing parasite, for another SCP that will get inside of you and do frightening things to your body. And make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss a single anomaly as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives.